Welcome everyone, this is another Chris Chorus with your host Chris, and today we are going to be developing no other than Pac-Man. So how do we develop a game like this? Well, you'll see over here, I have a handy to-do list for us. The very first thing we're going to need to do is set up our project with the correct files. We're going to need to generate map boundaries. So pretty much everything you see right here with the blue pipes, we're going to go ahead and generate that using code. We're going to need to add a Pac-Man with movement, of course, so we can go about our level. We're also going to need to add collision detection so we can go ahead and move in and out between these pipes and these different pathways with the exact same movement you see right here. You'll see we're not actually going through these pipes at all, so we're going to need to add some advanced collision detection there. We're also going to need to swap out these boundaries with images. So right now these are images, but we're going to start with squares. Just in the beginning, we're going to need to generate pellets that we can collect. We're going to need to add a score. So whenever we collect these pellets, the score goes up. We're going to create these little ghosts that move on their own with their own artificial intelligence. And then we're going to create a power up. You'll see one down there in the bottom right corner. If I get it, the ghosts turn blue for a small period of time, and then they eventually go back to normal. And then we're going to go ahead and add a win condition so that when we collect all these pellets, we get a console log that says you win great win condition i know and then we're going to go ahead and lay out a full level like this we're going to start basic and then also we're going to add in the famous pac-man chomp you see right here there will be a premium course for this as well it's going to resemble more of what you see in the actual pac-man game so this is the actual pac-man game available in arcades we're going to do some things such as adding ghost sprites as you see right here multiple lies pipes that go to opposite ends of the screen we'll be doing that in the premium tutorial but none of that let's just go ahead and get started with this free one. So let's go ahead and start with project setup. So in order to set up a project, what I like doing is I like heading inside of my finder. I go into a web directory of my choice. I like going inside my web directory for any web project I have. And I like creating a new folder. So to create a new folder using hotkeys, I'm just going to hit command shift N. And that should be control shift N if you're a Windows user. And you'll see I just created this new untitled folder right here. If I want to change the name, I'll just click it once. It's going to allow me to change the name. And now I could call this Pac-Man. It's just going to be my Pac-Man game. So now here's my folder, and now I want to create some files inside of it. So in order to create these files, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this directory I just created on top of Sublime Text, and that's going to go ahead and open up my folder within Sublime Text. I can now begin creating files within this project. So in order to create a file, what I can do is I can go to File, New File, or hit Command N, and here is my first file. So now that I have this, I can hit Command S, or I can go to File, Save, right here, and now I'm going to save this as what? Well, I'm going to save this as index.html, the base for our game. So I want to make sure I'm saving this under web and then under Pac-Man where we just created that new file. I hit save, we have our index.html file. So what I can do now is double click index.html and we just started the base for our game. But of course we have nothing inside of this. If I right click and inspect, you're going to see we just have an empty body tag and this is populated by Chrome automatically because we don't actually have anything within our file. So what do we need to create a Pac-Man game? Well, we're going to need a canvas element. It's going to look like this. We have an opening tag and a closing tag for our canvas element. We save and refresh, and now that is placed within our game. So looking good, but what else does a canvas game need? Well, we're going to need some sort of JavaScript file for us to write all of our code. So in order to do this, we can go ahead and create a new file with Command N or Control N for Windows. And here I'm going to go ahead and save and call this index.js, saving it within my Pac-Man directory. And now that I have this, I can go ahead and select our canvas within index.js. How do I do that? I'm going to create a constant called canvas and set it equal to. Well, I'm going to select our document object and then call query selector. That's going to allow me to grab any element within our HTML over here that's currently available. What element do I want to grab? Well, no other than our canvas element. So I go ahead, save that. And I want to go ahead and console log out canvas to make sure I'm actually pulling this in and that this is being logged out within our console. So if I save index.js and I refresh over here, you're going to see this is not being logged out. Why is that? Well, you need to make sure within index.html that you don't just create a canvas element, but you also create a script tag like so, and you reference the source of the script that you want to call within your HTML. So the source of the script I want to call is right here. It's going to be index.js. So I can simply put in index.js since we're within the same folder as index.html, save and refresh, and there is our canvas element being logged from index.js. 
So the next thing I'm going to do is select our canvas context. This is what's going to allow us to call all of our different canvas draw functions. Pretty much a requirement for any canvas game you're going to do. So in order to select this, I'm going to create a const called C, arbitrarily named. It just stands for context. I like it really short because I use this so many times. And I'm going to set this equal to canvas.get context with a capital C. And now what kind of context do I want to get? A 2D or a 3D context? Basically, what API do I want to get? Well, I want to get the API associated with the 2D functions. This is going to be a 2D game. So I just go ahead, put 2D as a string right here within our argument. And now if I save and console log out C and refresh, we have our canvas rendering context. So we did that correctly as well. So the next thing I want to do to set up our game is if I inspect one more time over here and let me go ahead and put this console on at the bottom. If I inspect our canvas, you're going to see it is not taking up the full width and height of our screen. So that's the next thing we want to do is make sure this is taking up the full width and height. I always like doing this within JavaScript. I'm not a huge fan of doing it within CSS. So in order to do this within JavaScript, we can select our canvas element, and that is just referencing this right here within our HTML. And we can go ahead and set its width equal to what? Enter width. I do that, save and refresh. And now you see our canvas is taking up the full width of the screen instead of that smaller amount. Now, for those of you new to my courses, where does inner width come from? Well, it comes from a window object. The window object is provided by default by our browser window, and it comes with all these different properties, all these different methods that'll help us throughout our development. So if you're using a property such as inner width that comes from the window element, well, you can go ahead and get rid of window dot because the browser is smart enough to know that this is a property on top of that window object. So if we want to clean up our code a little bit, we get rid of window dot. We just reference inner width, and this is more of an advanced technique because you need to know while well, inner width is coming from that window object in the first place, but it does clean up your code a little bit because you get rid of window dot. So I'm going to go ahead and keep inner width because I'm used to having it. And then I want to go ahead and make sure we're setting not just our width, but our canvas height as well. So I'm going to go ahead and reference canvas height and say that this should be equal to inner height. That is going to be the window dot inner height property. So I'll save and refresh inspect our canvas and now you'll see it is indeed almost the full width and height of our browser why is it not the full width and height well because we have this gutter on the top and also the left hand side of our screen where is this gutter coming from well if i inspect our body tag right here within the elements tab of chrome you're going to see the body tag if i'm inside of styles has a margin of eight pixels by default so if you don't apply any styling to index.html on your own Google and Chrome are going to put in eight pixels of margin on your body tag by default. So we need to tell Chrome not to do that. In order to tell Chrome not to do that, I'm going to head into index.html, create a style tag, and now I can start writing CSS inside of this. If you're new to CSS, you can always take my CSS masterclass. It is quite helpful for getting you up to speed, but since this is going to be a Canvas course, we're just going to do this pretty quickly. We're going to go ahead and reference our body. So basically we're referencing this tag right here. And now that we have body selected, we can go ahead and select margin like so and set it equal to zero. So basically we're going to override the browser default. We just need to make sure we save. And then if we refresh, and inspect our canvas, you'll see there is no gutter around it anymore. Our canvas is going to be the full width and height of our screen. Now, the very last thing I want to do for project setup is I just want to make sure that our background is black because if we look at the original Pac-Man game, all well, the background is black, not white. And it's a little easier on the eyes. So let's go ahead and make our body have a background dash color. This is a CSS property of no other than black. We can put that directly in there. And then if we save and refresh, now we have a black background and we can begin working on our game. So if we go on over to to do, we can go ahead and check off project setup. So the very next thing we're going to do is generate our map boundaries. So if we look at the original example I showed, we have all these boundaries on the outside of our level. We have some boundaries on the inside. We're going to be generating all of these, but we're not going to be using those pipes that you see right here. We're actually just going to be using basic squares. So in order to do this, we're going to head back on over to index.js. And here we're going to create a class called boundary. 
So simple enough, we'll go ahead and add some opening and closing curling brackets. And this is going to have a constructor associated with it because each boundary that we create needs to have a differentiating property associated with it, specifically for its position. So what kind of properties does a boundary have? Well, if we go back to our game over here, let's think to ourselves. Well, basically each boundary is a square connected to the next one. So if we say that this right here is one square and then the one next to it is also one square, well, we know that our properties for the square are going to be a position. So this is position one, this would be position two, and we're going to have a width and then a height associated with each boundary, each boundary square that is. So for our properties within our boundary, what we want to say is that each boundary is going to have a position associated with it. This is going to be a variable position. So instead of setting this statically, like so, setting an X, this would be a static position. Instead of doing that, we're going to go ahead and set it dynamically by declaring that this dot position should be equal to position. And if I ever want to go ahead and do this dynamic referencing like we're doing right now, we need to make sure that through our constructor argument that we're passing through this position we're referencing. So we could go ahead and write position right here as the first argument, but I don't really like passing arguments through our constructor this way. Instead, I like passing them through within an object as a property. And this means I only have to pass through one argument within our constructor and the ordering of our properties within this one object right here do not matter. If I did not have this one object right here and I were to add other arguments such as let's just say velocity, well I would need to memorize the order in which position and velocity are placed within our constructor function. But if I were to place velocity within our first object as the first argument, well I no longer need to memorize the order when I actually create a boundary. I can go ahead and interchange these two if needed, and it makes our job a lot easier to actually develop this whole thing. So that's besides the point, but a little bit of coding tips for you to help better yourself as a developer. So we're going to go ahead and pass through a position when we create a boundary. What else did we need? Well, we needed a width associated with a boundary, and we're going to go ahead and set this to a static value. This should never change. I'm going to say this is equal to 40. And then we need a height. I want this to be a square. So if we want a square, our height should be 40, the same as our width. So those are all the properties we really need for our boundary to start, but how should we actually draw out a boundary? What should it look like? Well, in order to determine what a boundary should look like, I'm going to go ahead and add a function inside of our class called draw. So draw right here is going to determine what a boundary looks like. It's important to note that this draw function is arbitrarily named. I could literally name this anything, and this would still be a valid function, but it makes sense to us to call this draw because we are drawing out our boundary. It determines what a boundary looks like. So within our draw function, how do I actually draw a square? Well, what I want to do is select our canvas context. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that with no other than C. And now I can call the function, the method, fill rect. What does this take as its arguments? Well, it's going to take an X, a Y, a width, and a height. And what do you know? We have all those available to us within our constructor function. So let's go ahead and grab our position of X. We're going to do that with this dot position dot X. We know we need a Y. We're going to select that with this dot position dot Y. And then we need a width. So we'll go ahead and add this dot width. And then for our fourth argument, we're going to add this dot height. So if I were to create a boundary and actually call this draw function, we would indeed draw out a square, but if we don't determine a color right here, that square by default is going to draw out as black. If the square draws out as black on our black background, we're just not going to see it. So before we actually fill this rect, we want to go ahead and call a C dot fill style with a capital S and set it equal to a string that determines what color it should be. So I'm going to go ahead and say by default, our outer boxes should be blue. And now this will draw a blue square on the screen when we actually call this draw function. So if I save and refresh, nothing happening just yet. We need to actually create a boundary to start. So just to show you that this is rendering correctly, let's go ahead and create a boundary. I'm going to create a const called boundary with a lowercase b and set this equal to a new boundary, which references our class right here. And then I can go ahead and add some parentheses. And now you can see that it takes one argument. It's going to be an object with a property of position. So I'm going to add that object in there with an opening and closing curly bracket. And then I can add the property of position. And now if we look at position within our code, we're referencing an X property and a Y property. So position should be equal to an object with an X. Set that equal to, let's just say zero to start. 
and then a Y, which will also set to zero. This means it's going to spawn at the top left-hand corner of our screen. So if I go ahead and save that, and a refresh, still nothing, and that is totally okay, because in order to draw this out, we need to call our new boundary object that we just instantiated, and then call the draw method on top of it. So now if I do that, and refresh, we have our first boundary in place right here. I'll go ahead and exit out of our console. This is what everything should look like to start. We successfully drew out our first boundary within our game. So there are a couple of ways in which we can draw out a full map with our boundaries. One, we could continue what we're doing right here of creating consonants and then eventually calling the draw method. So what I could do is I could copy this, paste it below, call this boundary two, and then make sure I'm placing it to the right of this one that we just created. So we know the width of this is going to be about 40 pixels. If I want to place directly to the right, I'll say position for X should be 41, and then make sure I'm calling boundary two dot draw. Now we have this directly to the right of our first boundary. Now, why shouldn't we do things this way? Well, it's just really inefficient and it also muddles up our code a lot. We're creating all these different consonants. We're calling the draw functions. It means we have all these different consonants to remember. It's just not a good way of doing things. So what is one way we can do this better? What we can do is we can go ahead and create a const called boundaries, set equal to an array like this. So what we could do is we can take these new boundaries we're creating. So I'm going to copy everything from new boundary down to the ending statement right here, cut it out. I'll delete const boundary, I'll delete boundary draw. And what I just cut out, I'm going to paste inside of this boundaries object like so. I'm going to do the exact same thing for boundary two, copy new boundary, and then make sure that I add a comma because this is going to be a second element within the boundaries array. If I add a comma here, I could put a new one in there. So I paste that second one in I can get rid of this code, save and refresh, and our boundaries are gone, but now we can do this a little more cleanly. We can go ahead and call our boundaries const, loop through it with a for each statement, and then we wanna say for each boundary, within our boundaries array, I wanna call an arrow function, a callback function, that says to do what? Well, I'm going to select that one boundary object we're looping over. So the first iteration of the loop, I'm only selecting this one. And if I only select this one, what can I do? I can call boundary dot draw. And then eventually this for each loop is going to go to the next one and call boundary.draw for this one. So if I save and refresh, now everything is still there, but we cleaned up our code a little bit because we're only declaring one const instead of what would have been many const. So if we wanted to create our full map, what we could do is we could go ahead and add a comma here, right at the end of our second boundary, paste in a new boundary and keep on going. But another issue with this is, while well, we have to keep track of all the different X and Y positions, the order of this doesn't really matter in regards to where we're placing these out on our map. And it's also going to give us just a ton and ton of code if we want to go ahead and create a full thing. So although this method is better than the last one, it's still not perfect. We can do a step better. So what else can we really do? Well, what we're going to do, and I think this is the best method to create a map, is we're going to create a const right above our boundaries and call this map. This is also going to be equal to an array. So what do we do with this array? Well, within this array, we're actually going to create a representation of what our map should look like within our canvas. So here's how we're going to do it. Within this array right here, I'm going to create an additional array. So you'll see right here, there's an array within an array. Now that I have this nested array, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a string. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a dash right here to say that whenever I loop over this dash, I want to generate a new square. This will make more sense as we go, just stick with me. So we have this one dash string. I'm going to go ahead, add a comma next to it, and then paste in a new dash string. And I'm going to go ahead and paste in, let's just say about six of these. So save and refresh. This is what it should look like. I'll expand that a little more. We have one row. So each of these dashes is going to represent one box within our game. So to take this further, what we can do is we can select this first array that we created within the array, and we can add a comma at the end of it and paste in a second version of this array. And I'm going to add in a few rows. So add a comma there, paste in a new array with all the dashes, and then paste in a new one. You can go ahead and indent format this to look exactly like what I have right here. Right now, if we were to render this out, we would draw out a six column by four row grid. 
every time we have a dash, we're basically saying create a box. So even in the center, we would have boxes. So instead of having boxes in the center, we can go ahead and add a different symbol here. Let's say we just want a blank space. We can go ahead and get rid of the dash. Just put a space here instead. We only want to use one character so everything aligns perfectly within these arrays. I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of all these dashes within the middle of our game. So within the third row, I want to go ahead and get rid of these dashes as well. So now if we look at this, we have these dashes which represent boxes, and these boxes are creating an outer perimeter with all this open empty space in the middle. So what we can do is we can begin looping through this map and based on which symbol we are currently looping over, we are going to determine whether or not we should place a box or just keep it empty space. So what we can do is we can get rid of everything within our boundaries array right here. We're still going to keep our boundaries array because as we loop through this map, we're going to be populating our boundaries array. We're just going to do it dynamically. So we also want to keep our boundaries for each code down here because we need a way to call the draw method on all the boundaries we're going to be populating. So we'll keep this as is, but right beneath boundaries, what we're going to do is we're going to select our map right here. So we're selecting this constant. We want to begin looping through it. So we're going to call for each. So for each what? What does the first array represent within our map? Well, it's going to represent a row. So what we can say is, for each row within our map, we want to call a callback function, an arrow function like so. And now what do we do? Well, we need to select within our first row, every symbol within the row. So how do we actually do this? Well, the same way we access any other element within an array. We're going to select our row. So we have the first row right now in the first iteration, this one right here. And now we can go ahead and call for each for each what within the row. Well, these are going to be symbols, so it makes sense to call this what a symbol. Arbitrarily named, can be whatever you want. But we're going to go ahead and add an arrow function to the end of that. And now if I console log this out, just our symbol right here, and then I head on over to our browser, refresh, open up our console, you're going to see that all of our symbols are logged out in the direct order they are placed within our map. So now that we have our symbols selected, we can begin populating our boundaries array based on where each of these is placed. So in order to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out a switch statement that says I want to switch out the symbol that we are currently on. So let's just go ahead and focus on this first one. Symbol is going to be equal to a dash. So I'm going to create opening and closing curly brackets. We're switching symbol out for what? What case? Well, we need to go ahead and write case and then specify what we want to switch out. So we're going to create a string of dash and say whenever we hit a dash right here, we're going to call a colon and then activate some sort of code after it. And once we activate that code, once we're done with it, we're going to call break, which breaks out of the switch case statement and then we'll proceed us on to the next loop iteration of our for each statement right here. So I want to say, if we're looping over a dash within our map, I want to select our boundaries array, and I'm going to push into it a new boundary. What does boundary take? It takes an object with a position property, which is equal to an X, and then also a Y. So if we were to save this as is and refresh, we have all of our boundaries drawn in the top left-hand corner because all our positions are X and Y. But I can guarantee you we have more than just one boundary being created because we specified that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, probably like 15 to 20 different boundaries within this array right here. But in order to make sure that they're drawn in the correct spot, we need to understand first what row are their associated symbols in? Are they in the first row, second row, third row, or fourth? And then what column are they in? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Which row and which column are they in? How do we get the row and column indices? Well, within for each, we have a row being passed through, but we can add a comma to the end of this right here, this argument, and then we can go ahead and add in an argument for an index. So we can call this whatever we want, it really doesn't matter. But for me, whenever I loop through something, I just like shorthanding it with I, this stands for index. You can go ahead and write index out as well, that's totally okay, but I'm just going to use I because we're going to be using a second index within this for each. Nevertheless, this I right here represents what row are we currently on within our for each loop. So we're going to be looping through row zero, row one, row two, and row three. So we know with our rows, when they go down, we're dealing with a Y coordinate. So what we can do is we can go ahead and select the width of one of our boundaries. What was the width of one of our boundaries? Well, it was going to be 40. And now let's think about this. Since we have this index, remember, if we loop through the first row right here, our index is going to be equal to zero. 
So on the first iteration of this loop, 40 times zero, it's going to make sure y is zero. It's going to put our first one right here. But if we go to the next iteration of i, this is going to be equal to one. So we get i right here equal to one, multiply it by 40. Then we're going to push y down by 40. The next iteration of our box is going to be right beneath it. So if you think about it, if we multiply 40 by our row index i, save and refresh, you're going to see our rows were just created for the left side right here. The reason they haven't been created for our columns as well, as you see right here within our map, is simply because we haven't set x equal to anything other than zero. So each boundary has a width of 40, and we know that once we're within a row, we're looping over each symbol. So what is the index of this first symbol? It's going to be zero. What is the index of the second symbol? It's going to be one. Then we have two, three, four, five. We're just going to keep going until we finish through this whole array within the first row. If we wanna go ahead and grab the index associated with each symbol, we can go ahead and add a comma to the end of symbol right here, and then add in J, and now we have the associated index. So once we're looping through the indices, we can go ahead and multiply X by J right here, save and refresh. And now we have a perfect one-to-one -one representation of what we see in the map. If we wanted to recreate this using one of the other methods, well, we'd have to create probably around 15 to 20 new boundaries within our code. And so what would have been probably around 100 lines of code, we did it in about, I want to say, just 20. So a lot easier. It's going to save you a ton of time. And it's going to make things way easier for you in the future if you want to generate multiple levels for your Pac-Man game. Super, super cool way of doing things. So before we go ahead and check off generating boundaries within our to-do list, I want to do two more things. The first thing I want to do is I want to lay out a little more of a level. I just want to go ahead and extend this by one row and then draw out some boundaries right here within the middle of this actual map we created and that way we get a little bit of flexibility for developing our collision detection so in order to do this i'm just going to copy one of the lines right here within our map i'm going to paste in that new one and then i know right here is the very center of our map so i can go ahead and get rid of the space add a dash in the places i want a box drawn i can save and then refresh and now we have this little corridor in which our Pac-Man will be able to travel through. It's going to be really good for development to get things set up this way as we do our collision detection. And now the very next thing I want to do is, you might note right here we are using a static value of 40 for both our width and height to move the position of our blocks around. So although we could just use 40 here, if we come back to this code at a later point in time, it's going to be hard for us to remember what this value actually represents. So instead of just referencing 40, we want to reference some sort of variable that references our boundary width. So how do we get our boundary width? Well, we could create a new boundary like so above and assign it to a variable, but that's just extra code. It's unnecessary. What we can do instead is within our class right here, we can create a static property. So what I'm going to do is right beneath boundary and above constructor, I'll go ahead and declare I want a static property by adding the static keyword. And then what property do I want to be static? Well, a width property. And I'm going to set this equal to 40 like we have down below. And then I'm going to do the same thing for height. So now that I have these static properties, I no longer need to create just a new boundary in order to set this position right here. Instead, I can just go ahead, get rid of the 40, and reference our boundary class like so. And then I can call on top of it the static property we want to get, which is going to be width. And then the same thing for our y coordinate right here, it's going to be our boundary dot height. So these are both equal to 40, but I don't have to create that object. And I'm still referencing the exact boundary width right here. We just have to make sure they're the same within our class. Not that big of a deal. So if I save and refresh, everything still works correctly. But now when we come to this code later on, we'll have a lot easier time understanding it because we replaced our static value with something that's actually readable. So now if I go back to our to-do list, we're going to go ahead and check off generating map boundaries. So the very next thing we're going to do is add a Pac-Man with movement. We're just going to spawn a circle right here, and then we want him moving around. We're going to go outside the boundaries to start. We just want to make sure we have a Pac-Man that's moving. And then once we do that, we'll add the collision detection to make sure he can only stay within these boundaries. So let's go ahead and add a Pac-Man. So in order to add a Pac-Man, what I like doing is creating a class called player. You could go ahead and call this Pac-Man. I'm just so used to creating a class called player for the main thing I moved. So I'm going to go ahead and call my class player. This is going to have an opening and closing curly bracket. And then I'm going to create a constructor like so. And then I need to determine what makes a player, what makes a Pac-Man. 
Well, we know our player needs to be drawn and moved across the screen. So if you ever need something drawn on the screen, you're almost always going to have a position property. So we'll add this dot position and set it equal to a dynamic position. We'll pass through our constructor. We're also going to have a velocity. So this dot velocity. We'll go ahead and also pass this through. And velocity just means our player is going to be moving. So that's why we're adding that. And then we know Pac-Man is circular. So we're going to need some sort of radius. We'll add this dot radius. And let's just say Pac-Man is going to have a radius of about 10 pixels to start. We'll go ahead and tune this as needed. So now that we have our properties in place, that should be all we need to draw out a Pac-Man. We'll add a draw method like so. And now how do we draw out a circle whenever we call draw? Well, we're going to want to call our canvas's arc method. But before we call that arc method, in order to use this, we need to call c.beginPath to tell our canvas context we want to begin a path, such as an arc. So now that we have begin path in here, we can call c.arc. Arc. This takes quite a few arguments. You'll see right here the very first is going to be an X position, the second is going to be a Y position. So let's go ahead and take care of those two to start. What is X going to be equal to? Well, this dot position dot X. Our second argument right here is going to be this dot position dot Y. What comes next? Well, we have a radius which is equal to a number. What do you know? We have a radius property within our player. So we'll go ahead and reference this dot radius. And then we come to the hard stuff. It's going to be start angle and end angle. So these two arguments right here, these are going to be in radians, just a fancy version of degrees. So if you need to learn a little bit more about radians and drawing circles, you can check out my video on circular motion. And that goes pretty in depth with radians and also things such as sine and cosine to create circles. But nevertheless, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. We know the start radian should be zero, which means we just start at one point of the circle. If we want to create the full circle, we're going to reference math.py and then multiply it by two because in radians math.pi just means half a circle we multiply that by two we're going to get a full circle we don't need the six argument in there so we can just call c.arc then we want to call out c dot close path so we seem to be in good shape but one thing we need to do is to declare the fill style of our pac-man so if i go ahead and say c dot fill style is equal to yellow right before we close the path well, now I have the fill style in place, I need to actually call c.fill to fill up this arc we just created. So I'll go ahead and call c.fill, like so, save and refresh, no Pac-Man, simply because we have the blueprint for our player, now we actually need to create an instance of our player to draw it out. So in order to create an instance of our player, I can go ahead and create a const, and I'll actually do this right beneath boundaries. I'll create a const called player, lowercase p, equal to what? A new player object. And this doesn't take any constructor arguments because we haven't specified any. So let's go ahead and make sure we do that. We want to pass through one argument, an object, which has two properties, a position property, and then comma, velocity property. So now that this is within our constructor, when we create a new player, we can add what? One argument with a position. We're going to set this equal to an X that is equal to, let's just say 40 to start. And then we're going to say our Y should be equal to 40 as well. And then we need to, right beneath our position, add a velocity, which is also going to have an X and a Y. I don't want this moving at all, so I'll set X equal to zero, and then Y equal to zero as well. So we took care of the two properties within our constructor right here, and now all we need to do is draw out our player. So right beneath where we are drawing out our boundaries, I can call player.draw, save and refresh, we have our player drawn out on the screen. Perfect. So in regards to positioning, if we want to make sure that our Pac-Man is drawn right here instead of this little corner where the boundary is, well, what we can do is we can go ahead and alter its original position. So right now this is 4040, but if we want to go ahead and spawn it there, we can be a little cleaner with our code. So instead of referencing 40, how did we reference 40 when we were creating boundaries? We use the static property of boundary width and boundary height. We're going to do the exact same thing for player. So instead of referencing 40 right here for X, we'll go ahead and say place it at boundary width. That's going to move us on the X axis over to about here. And if we do the same for our height, we just move down on our Y axis to where we are right now. But how do we get this position right here? Well, if you think about it, if we move over half the distance of one of these boundaries on the X axis, we're going to be placed right in the middle right here. And if we move down half the distance on the height of one of these boxes, we're going to be placed right where we want to be. So for x, we could say add on the boundary dot width and divide it by two. 
and that should push us right about here. Save and refresh. We are there, and now we want to do the same thing for height. Add on our boundary dot height divided by two, and we are in the perfect location. We don't actually fill up much of this actual corridor though, so let's go ahead and increase our radius for our player to not 10, but rather 15. We save and refresh, and now we're filling up a good chunk of everything we see. So how do we get our player moving now that we have it drawn out on the screen? Well, we need to listen for events within our keyboard. We're going to move our player using the WASD keys. That's pretty standard for any movement within a video game. So in order to add these event listeners, we're going to go to the bottom of our file and then call window.addEventListener. This takes a string as the first argument of what event do we want to listen for? Well, we're going to want to listen for a key down event. So whenever a user presses down on our keyboard, we want to call some sort of function as our second argument. So for our second argument, I'm going to add in an arrow function like so. And remember, anytime you have window dot, like we have right here, you can just go ahead and get rid of it because the browser is smart enough to know that we are calling add event listener on top of it. And make sure you spell listener right, like me, or else this won't work at all. So I add the E there. We should be good to go. I can go ahead and console log out some code, just anything within a string. Refresh. Open up our console. The shortcut for that within Chrome, by the way, is command option J, which is how I'm opening it up so quickly. And you'll see right here, if I refresh again, we don't have anything within our console, but if I click on our game and I start pressing down on all of our keys, well, each time I press down on a key, we're logging out this code right here. So we are successfully listening for key down events. Now we only want to listen for events in where we press WASD. So in order to do this, within our callback function right here, we can pass through an event object. Let's go ahead and console log this out. I'll console log out, event, save and refresh, hit some keys, and we're logging out this keyboard event. So you'll see inside of this, this has all these different properties associated with the actual pressing of a key. Maybe too much for something so simple, right? So if we scroll down, we have things such as code, we have things such as whether or not the control key was pressed along with this, and then we also have what key we pressed. So you'll see right here, key is equal to D. I just hit the D key, and event right here was smart enough to know that. So if I want to go ahead and just select this one property within console log, I could reference event.key like so, but we can make our code cleaner because we know we're going to be using event.key for multiple keys. And instead of having to prefix key with event every time, within our argument right here, we can go ahead and add opening and closing curly brackets to destructure this property. We can say, as long as we have curly brackets right here, we only want to grab the exact properties we specify. What property do we want to grab here? Well, we want to grab the key property that is from our event object. So all we have to do within these curly brackets is type key, and now we have the key property. You can see this as I console log out, just key. Refresh and then start pressing on our keyboard, A, S, D, W. We just logged out the exact key we are pressing down, but we don't need to reference that event object. Makes our code a little cleaner and easier to read. So now I want to call different code for each key that we press here for WASD. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a switch case statement that says to switch out whatever key we're pressing. If we press down a case of, let's start out with the W key, which means we should go up. We add a comma to the end of this, and then we break. In between this case and this break, we can specify what we want to happen. So what do we want to happen whenever we press W? We want to go ahead and change the velocity of our player to be going upwards. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and select our player, select its velocity, on the y-axis, and whenever you want your player to go upwards on the y-axis, you should set the value equal to something that's negative. Because on canvas with the y-axis, when we reference a value up here for y, we're going to start at zero, and the further down you go, the greater these values get. So the y-axis is reversed, simply because when we're dealing with web development, things start out at the top of the page rather than the bottom. So we know that our player should be going up when we press W, so our player velocity should be equal to something like negative Five. We're going to push our player upwards. So that's going to take care of the case for W when we press W. Now we can go ahead and copy these three lines, paste a new one below, and say what should our case be for A when we're supposed to go to the left? Well, our player velocity on the x-axis should be negative five. So that just means we're going to the left. We want to do the same thing for S and D. So we're going to go ahead and add a case right here for S. And really quickly, I'll go ahead and paste in another case for D. So let's go back and focus on S. When I hit S, I know I want to go down. So we're going to select our Y axis, and whenever we go down, we're going to be 
adding a positive value. We're going to be assigning y a positive value. And then for d, we should be going to the right. So on our x-axis right here, we're not going to go in a negative direction. We're going to go in a positive direction over to the right. So what I'm going to do here is I'll delete our console log. Actually, I'll cut it out. And then I'm going to paste it beneath our switch. And then I'm going to log out our player dot velocity, save and refresh. And now when I hit W, you'll see our Y velocity set to negative five. If I hit A, now we have negative five, negative five, X is going to be negative five, five. Basically all these velocities are changing based on which key I'm pressing. The thing is we haven't actually set our player to move based on these velocities. So we need to go back up to our player class right here and we determine what a player should look like when it's drawn out on the screen, but we haven't determined how our player should move when we call an update function. So what we're going to do is add a function called update. And basically we want this to be called for every frame of an animation loop. So within here, what are we going to do? We're going to go ahead and draw out our player. We're calling this.draw, which just calls all this code right here. And then we're going to select our position on the X axis. And for every frame we loop through, we're going to be adding on our player's velocity. So this dot velocity on the X axis. We want to do the exact same thing, not just for X, but also for Y for each frame that we loop through. So we have this update function, which determines how our player should move over time. Let's go ahead and find where our player is being drawn right here, replace draw with update, save and refresh and start moving around on your keys. And you're going to notice nothing is happening. Our player is not moving, even though we just updated that update function. Why? Well, it's because this code right here, where we're drawing out player update and boundary draw, it's only being called once on initial load of this index.js file. We need to create an animation loop that calls this code for each frame of that animation. And it's just going to keep calling itself until we tell it to otherwise. So to create an animation loop, I'm going to go ahead and create a function called animate, create some opening and closing curly brackets. And now inside of this function, I want to call request animation frame comes from the window object takes one argument. What is the function we want to loop through? Well, it's going to be the parent function that this is inside of. So it's going to be animate. Whenever we complete one frame, we're going to call this animate function again is what it says. It's going to create an infinite loop for us until we tell it to stop otherwise. And we can always test that this is working by adding in a console log. And let's just add some gibberish right here. And then we need to activate the animate function by actually calling animate and then adding these ending parentheses to call the function. So if I save and refresh, now we have this looping through super fast. We just created an animation loop, but we want to go ahead and make sure that we're drawing out our boundaries and we're drawing out our player for each frame of this animation loop. So I'll get rid of the console log and replace it with our boundaries for each code and also our player update code. We save and then refresh. That's all being drawn out. And now when I hit D on our keyboard, we call that update function, which should be adding some sort of velocity onto our player's position over time. For each iteration of this loop, watch what happens. I hit D, our player is moving super quickly across the screen, and we're actually creating some sort of artwork on here as well. And you'll see if I refresh, if I hit down, I could press all over the place to create this pretty crazy artwork. And this might be pretty cool, but obviously it's not what we want for our game. The first thing we want to do is make sure that we don't create these lines as we move through our screen. So every time we call animate, we're drawing out our player in a new position, but we're not actually clearing our canvas, which is going to give us a completely blank slate to draw on. So whenever we call request animation frame right after it, we want to clear the canvas. We're going to do that with C dot clear rect. And then this takes an X, a Y, a width and a height. So from which position do we want to clear our canvas? I'm going to say from the very, very start of our canvas for X. So right over here are both X and Y, the very top left corner of our canvas. And then I want our canvas to extend the full width and the full height of what we have right here. I want to clear the whole canvas width and the whole canvas height for our fourth argument. And with this, if we save and refresh and start moving, we no longer have that drawing issue, although we definitely have some sort of issue with moving now that we're going diagonally in all these different directions. So our player is moving diagonally whenever we hit multiple keys on the keyboard because within our key down function right here, if we hit W, we might be going upwards, setting our player velocity Y equal to negative five. But if we go to the right at the same time by hitting D, we're also setting our player velocity X to five as well. So when we have a velocity of five for our X and negative five for our Y. That means our player should be moving diagonally, not in just one linear direction where we're going down, left, top, or to the right. So here's one way you may think to fix this is we can go ahead and copy this event listener we have right here, this whole thing, 
and right beneath it we're going to go ahead and paste it and then instead of listen for a key down event we're going to go ahead and listen for a key up event so if we think about it if we hit right on the keyboard if we hit d we're going to set the player velocity executable 5 which means we go to the right but if we key up on d maybe we should set our player velocity on the x-axis back to zero so it stops moving so let's go ahead and try that out for each key we left up on, I'm going to go ahead and set the velocity equal to zero. And then I'm going to save, refresh, and let's go to the right. I'm going to hold down on D, we go to the right, I lift up, and it stops. Let's test for going down, I hit S, lift up, and we stop. Hit right, lift up, we stop. Hit up, lift up, we stop. Now this works great if we were to only be pressing down one key at a time. The real issue here comes when we try holding down two keys, which we're definitely going to be due when we try navigating this course. So for instance, if I try going back and forth between the left and the right, watch what happens. I'm going to go all the way to the right to illustrate this. And then when I try going back and forth really quickly, You'll see I'm holding down A and eventually we only get started after holding it down for a while. And that only even happens because I have it on my keyboard so that when I'm holding down A, it's actually just repeating that input over and over and over again really quickly. If I didn't have that in place, well, we'd just be stopped because our key up code is interfering with our key down code. If we're holding down both A and D to go left and right at the same time, well, of course, it's going to be equal to a value, but if we lift up on one of those, while both of them are down, we're going to be setting the velocity equal to zero, even though we might be meaning to go in some direction. So in order to alleviate this, we're not going to be setting our velocities right here. Within our event listeners, we're actually going to be setting them within our animation loop. But we need to know which keys are currently pressed down and what was the last key we pressed down in order to get the correct effect. So here's how I like doing this is I like creating, I'm going to do this right above our map right here. And before I create this, I'm actually going to go ahead and move map right above the four each, just to make our code a little easier to read. But I know right here, this is where I want all my implementation variables to go. So I know I want to create a const called keys. This is going to be equal to an object that's going to help us determine what keys are being pressed down. So I want to start off with our W key, create a property called W, and then within this W object I'm going to have a property called no other than pressed. Is the W key pressed by default? No it's not, so we're going to set it equal to false. I'm going to do this for W, A, S, and D. So I'll go ahead and copy W, add a comma, and I'll do this four times. So I have W, A, S and D, and just make sure you have a comma everywhere that it's needed. And now we have this set up correctly to track which key is currently being pressed. So if W is pressed, where should we be changing this property right here? Well, within our event listener. So whenever we press down W, we're no longer going to change our player velocity, but rather we'll go ahead and select keys. What key do we want to select? Well, this is going to be W. Is it pressed down? Yes, it is. So we're going to set that equal to true. So we can grab this line of code right here delete, and then paste in keys, not W, but A dot pressed is equal to true. We're going to do this for S as well. Delete the velocity. We're not selecting our A key, we're selecting our S key. And then when we press down D, we want to say that D is pressed down. So we also need a way to determine when the key is not pressed. We're going to do the same thing for key up. We're just going to set these back equal to false. So we can go ahead and grab keys dot W pressed, delete velocity right here, and then set this equal to false. And I'm going to do this for each key that we have for our game, set keys.a.pressed, equal to false. And then I can do the same thing for s, set this equal to false. And then do the same thing for d. We're going to set this also equal to false. So now we have a way to track when multiple keys are pressed down at the same time and when each one is lifted up. So instead of console logging out player velocity, I can console log out keys.d.pressed. And I'll also console log out, not just D, but also, let's go ahead and say S. And then I'm going to also console log these out whenever we key up. So if I save and refresh that, and I hit our D key, well, you'll see the first value right here, D is equal to true. And then the second value is equal to false. And then when we lift up, we have a false and false, which means we're both lifted up. But if I press both of these at the same time, both D and also S, we're getting double trues, which means that we have the ability to track whether or not keys are pressed down at the same time. So using this, we can begin moving our player within our animation loop instead of within these event listeners. So to do this, we're going to go ahead, head on over to animate. And beneath player.update, I can go ahead and say if keys dot w is pressed, meaning that it is pressed down, what do we want to do? We want to go ahead and select our player, 
specifically the velocity on what? The y-axis. We want to go ahead and set this equal to a negative value, so we're going to set it equal to negative 5. Just by saving and refreshing, if I hit W, we start going upwards, and this never actually goes back to zero because we never set it, well, to zero. If we wanted our player to stop when we lift up, well, we can simply call player.velocity.y right here whenever we go through our animation loop before we actually alter our velocity and set this equal to zero. So it's always going to be zero to start, but it might get overwritten, which means we're going to be moving our player. So if we go ahead and set this equal to zero, refresh, hit W again and lift up, we stop because we set it equal to zero. So now let's go ahead and add in our other keys. We can add else if what? Well, if our keys dot A is pressed, like so, what do we want to do? We want to go ahead and set our player dot velocity on the X axis equal to negative five, means we're going to go to the left and now we can simply copy this else if statement, paste it twice, and now we can go ahead and select not keys.a, but keys.s. That means we're going down, so we want to affect our y velocity, and say we want this equal to a positive value, that's going to push us downwards, and then if we press keys.d, we're going to be going to the right on the x-axis, so we're not selecting negative 5, we're selecting 5. And this should give us some pretty basic movement using the animation loop instead of the key down event listener. So I save and refresh, I hit S, we're going down, I lift up, we're set to zero again. I hit D, we go to the right, I lift up, well we're not stopping, simply because player velocity on the X axis is not set to zero. So I'll copy this line right here, change Y to X, set that equal to zero before we actually go through this, refresh, and now when I hit D, and I lift up, we stop, hit S, we lift up, stop, we can move in all these different directions using this simple code right here within our animation loop. And you might be thinking, well, we should be good to go with this, right? Well, not quite. We need to add a last key property as well. Why? Well, if we're going through this if else if, the first statement right here is going to be called before the next ones if they're pressed at the same time. So let's go ahead and start at the very bottom. I'm going to go ahead and press S and D so our player is right here. Let's go ahead and say I start going upwards by pressing W, and then I want to go to the right. I'm going to hold up W, and then press D, which means we should be going to the right. Watch what happens. I press W, press D, and we just keep on going. Why? Well, because we're only calling this first line of code because W is pressed. A is pressed as well. That was the last key we pressed down, but this code is not going to activate simply because this one comes first. This is the priority. So in order to make sure that we go the direction of whatever the last key was, we need to add that last key property. So in order to add this, I'm going to go up to where we are adding all these properties. And instead of declaring a const, I'm going to add a let, set it equal to last key. And then this is going to be a empty string by default. So with this last key property, I can begin setting it within our event listeners. So whenever we press down W, I'm going to set last key equal to a string of W. And I'm going to do this for every single case we have. So I'll copy this line, paste it in A, change W to A, paste it in S, change W to S, paste it in D, and change W to D. So each time we press down on one of these keys, we're basically overriding the last key that we pressed down, no matter if two, three, or four have been pressed. We don't need to do anything within key up, we just need to track the last key that was actually pressed down. So now we have this in place, we can add on to our conditional here that says, if W is pressed, if we're supposed to go up and our last key is equal to W, then we want to go up. But if our last key is not equal to W, and we recently pressed D while W is being pressed up, well then we want to call this code instead. So we're going to go ahead and add this AND statement onto the end of keys A dot pressed, and say if our last key is equal to A, then we want to go to the left actually, I think I might have messed that up. Nevertheless, we're going to go ahead and add this conditional ON to each condition that we have. So let's go ahead paste that on in there. We'll say this one right here is not referencing the last key A, but rather S. So we'll change. If our last key is equal to S, we want to go down. And then if our last key is equal to D, which we see right here, we want to go to the right. So just by adding this code, saving and refreshing, we're going to start off in the same spot down here. So now when I start going upwards by hitting W, and if I hit D while W is pressed, we should go to the right instead of just continuing upwards. So I hit W, hit D, we go to the right, 
And now I can have multiple keys down and start moving in all these different directions. And weird stuff isn't going to happen with our movement like it was earlier without last key. And when we were just activating our player velocity within these event listeners. So this is going to set us up for success when we're moving our player around our actual level right here. So I'm going to go ahead, head on over to to do and say that we added a Pac-Man with movement. So next up, we're going to go ahead and add collision detection so that we can only stay within this boundary right here. Okay, so how do we add collision detection into our game? Well, we're going to need to know circular to rectangular collision detection. Now, I don't have a video on specifically that, but I do have one on rectangular to rectangular collision detection. And it's probably helpful to view that even before going on to this one, so you can check it out right here. But let's get right on into this. So essentially what we want to do is we want to loop through every boundary we have within our map, and we want to check whether or not our player right here is overlapping any of those boundaries. If they are, then we want to stop our player's velocity altogether. So where within our code are we looping through all of our boundaries? Well, it's going to be right here. So we can continue writing this collision detection code directly within this for each statement, specifically for our boundaries. So we know we're grabbing one boundary at a time. How do we determine whether or not one of these boundaries overlaps with our player? Well, we can write an if statement. And then we want to go ahead and compare the sides of our player to the sides of one individual boundary. So let's go ahead and start with the top of our player. How do we grab the top of our player when our position point is directly in the center? Well, to get the top of our player, we'll go ahead and say if our player dot position dot x, that gives us the center of our player minus the player dot radius. That is going to give us the top. So we want to say if the top of our player is overlapping with the bottom of one of these boundaries. How do we go ahead and get the bottom of one of these boundaries? Well, first let's, let's finish our condition right here. We want to say if the top of our player is less than or equal to one of the bottom of the boundary. So getting the bottom of the boundary, we're going to go ahead and get our boundary that we're looping through. So this right here, specifically the position on the Y axis. So that's going to give us the top of a boundary. And then we want to add on our boundary dot height. And that is going to give us the bottom of a boundary. But before we proceed, make sure you don't do what I did right here. We are currently referencing the top of our player. So we want the coordinate on not the X axis, but the Y axis. This will give us the top of the player. This gives us the bottom of one of the boundaries. So we know if the top of the player is less than the point right here where the bottom of the boundary is, we know the two are colliding. But we also need to add a code for whether or not the right of a player is colliding with the left of a boundary as well. So let's go ahead and do that. We can add an and statement right here. And we're going to select our player position on the x-axis and to get the right of our player, we're going to go ahead and get our player radius, add it onto our position dot x. And then we want to say if this is greater than or equal to the left side of our boundary. So we're going to get our boundary dot position dot x. That'll give us the left side. Then we know we are colliding with the left side of a boundary. We want to keep going. Let's go ahead and do the bottom of our player. We'll add an and statement in here that says if our player dot position on the y-axis plus our player dot radius. So now we have the bottom of the player is greater than or equal to our boundary dot position dot Y. That's going to give us the top of the player. Then we know we're colliding on the Y axis specifically for the bottom of the player and the top of our rectangle. So we have one more, the leftover player. Let's go ahead and add an and statement that says if our player dot position dot X. So that is going to give us the center of our player minus our player dot radius. That'll give us the left-hand side is less than or equal to what? Well, we need the right side of a boundary. So we'll select our boundary, position dot X. That gives us the left side. So we need to add on the boundary width. That'll give us the right side of the boundary. Then we know our player is colliding with a boundary. This is all the code we have to write to get accurate collision detection in plays. So within this if statement, I can go ahead and say console.log, we are colliding if this is true. So if I save and refresh and we look within our console, you'll see this is not being logged out. But as soon as I start overlapping, we are currently colliding when the top of our player is overlapping the bottom. Let's go ahead and check this for all of our sides. If we overlap with the left of our player, we're getting that. And then if we overlap with the right, we're getting that. And then if we overlap with the bottom, we're getting that as well. So we have accurate collision detection in place. But now we need to go ahead and stop our player, not when we lift up on a key, but when we hit one of these boundaries. So we know by default, we're setting X and Y equal to zero because before we wanted to stop our player whenever we lifted up on one of these keys. The Pac-Man movement, the player always moves until it actually hits a boundary. So we're actually going to comment these out. We're probably not going to use these anymore. 
but we do need to comment these out to get the effect where we stop whenever we hit a wall. So if we are colliding, what should happen? Well, let's go ahead and set our player dot velocity dot x equal to zero inside of here. And we'll go ahead and set our player velocity dot y equal to zero as well. We're just going to stop our player completely if they're colliding with one of these boundaries. So let's go ahead and save and refresh. And then we go to the right. And now we stop completely. But you'll notice if I try to go down after we collide with the right side of our player, I'm hitting S right now. Nothing is happening. I'm hitting up, nothing is happening. I'm hitting right, nothing's happening. I'm hitting left, nothing is happening. Why is that? Well, now that we are overlapping with the wall over here, this code is continuously being ran. We can't change our position if this is just continuously going to be true. So what we have to do is within this equation, we need to take into account our player is going to have a velocity. So if we add velocity into this collision detection equation, we can detect whether or not our player is about to overlap with a wall over here. And if they are about to overlap, then we are going to set their x and y velocity equal to zero, but it's still going to allow us to continue calling this code down here. So right here, this is the top side of our player. We want to go ahead and say, if the top of our player plus our player velocity on the y axis, so plus player dot velocity on the y axis is less than the bottom of our boundary. And the reason we're adding on our velocity right here is because this value is going to be negative. Whenever we're moving up, velocity dot y is negative. So basically, if we add a negative value onto this, we're essentially subtracting it. So that takes care of the top side of our player. We want to do the same thing for the right side of our player. We're going to add on our player dot velocity dot x. And now for the bottom of our player, we want to add on our player dot velocity dot y. And then we want to make sure for the left side of our player, we add on our player dot velocity dot X. So now we're only going to be colliding if one of the sides of our players plus its current velocity is overlapping with the rectangle. So our player is never actually going to overlap, but it will allow us to set our velocities equal to zero, setting this equal to false, and then allow us to follow the coloring code and render it all out. So if I go ahead and save and refresh, and I try hitting the side over here, you're going to see we actually stop before we hit it because we have that velocity added into our collision detection code. But since our velocity on the x-axis is zero now, this is going to be set equal to false. So if I go ahead and try hitting down, we're going to be allowed to move down now instead. And this actually works in all directions, no matter which keys I press. We never get stuck and we're limited to this little grid that we have right here for movement. So this is looking great, but we do want to test for if we have a gap somewhere in the center. So if we're moving and we're holding down, we should be able to pass through that gap. So let's go ahead and add one of those. In order to add a gap into our game, well, it looks like we're going to need to create one more column right here. So to create a column, what I can do is I can go ahead and copy one of these guys at the top within our first row, paste it in. And then I'm just going to do the exact same thing for our other rows, just paste in that same character. And you see on a refresh, now we just have this big wall right here. So we'll go ahead and change the dashes on the inside to spaces, because we know we want our player to be able to move out freely through these. So I'll change those right there, looking good. And we want to fill in this one spot there. So I'll go ahead and do that now. Replace our space with a dash. And then right here in the middle, I want to make this dash a space. So I'll do that, save and refresh. So now we have this little gap, which we should be able to travel through. So you'll see with this, if I try getting inside the center, it's really hard to do because whenever I go to the side and I hit up, well, that's how I got it. But whenever I go to the side and I hit down or up on the bottom, it's just not exact. I have to really time it exactly to get in there. And we're not actually moving. We stop whenever we hit one of these blocks. We want to make sure that we never stop and that when we're holding up while we travel side to side, that we actually move through this right here. So we need to go into our animate loop and add some conditionals that predict the movement of our player in all directions. Basically, we're going to be moving to the side. And as we hit up right here, we need to predict whether or not we are about to collide with this one boundary right here. If we are about to collide, we're not actually going to be changing our Y velocity so that we do and we stop. We're just going to make sure that our Y velocity is equal to zero. But if there are no collisions while we're holding up, that is when we're going to change our Y velocity to five. So the code we need to edit in order to do this is going to be our if statements where we're holding down on one of the keys. Now it kind of makes sense that when we're altering our player's velocity to call this before 
all of our rendering code, so I'm actually going to move it right beneath clear rect. That way I can read our code more clearly and say whenever we press down on one of these, we're going to detect for a collision right after we change this velocity. So it's just a little easier to read, at least for me. I'm going from top to bottom within my code. So let's start with trying to get through the gap when we're on the bottom here. So as I move to the side, we have this collision detection in place that allows us to go side to side, of course. But when I go to the right and I hold up, I want to be able to hold W without affecting our player velocity dot Y. Because as soon as I do this, this code down here is going to trigger because we're going to be colliding with this one boundary right here. And what happens when we collide with it? Well, we set our X and Y velocity equal to zero. It just makes us stop completely. We don't want to do that. We want to go ahead and predict if we're going to collide into this. And if we are, then our Y velocity is not going to be equal to negative five. It's going to be equal to zero. But if we're not colliding with anything, then we are going to set this. Then we're going to start moving up. So how do we detect? How do we predict into the future that we are colliding with a boundary? Well, we just simply need to use this exact code that we have right here. Now if I were to go ahead and copy this and say if within our W key we go ahead and call this collision detection code, it's going to make our code very, very messy. So if you're just going to reuse a conditional like this, it makes sense to create some sort of function to make your code a lot cleaner. So right above animate, I'm going to create a function called circle collides with rectangle. Because this is circular and rectangular collision detection, I think that makes sense to call it that. And then I want to go ahead and return that exact conditional that we had for our collision detection. So we're going to go ahead and wrap these in parentheses and then just make sure that I delete this if statement down here so I can auto format my code and it's going to look like this. So when we use this function, we're going to want to go ahead and pass through an object with two properties because we're going to be passing through two objects into this to test whether or not they collide. What is the first property? The first object we want to pass through, it's going to be a circular object, so call it circle. And then the second one is going to be a rectangle, so we're going to pass through a rectangle property as well. So now that we have these properties within our function, we just need to make sure that we refactor this conditional right here. So what I'm going to do is any place we have player, I'm going to go ahead and select each of these by hitting command D with player selected in sublime text. You see, as I keep hitting that, we keep going to the next iteration of player. And now if I go ahead and change these and paste in, our circle instead, this function is going to work the same way. But we need to make sure we're doing the same thing for our boundary as well. So wherever we have boundary, we want to replace it with no other than rectangle. So I'm going to select all of our boundaries with command D in sublime text and then paste in rectangle. And now we can begin using circle collides with rectangle. So right here within our F statement, let's go ahead and make this about five lines of code. We're going to change it into probably three or four. So we're going to call circle collides with rectangle. We know it takes a property with a circle. What is our circle? It's going to be our player. And then it takes a rectangle. This is going to be our boundary. So if I save that and refresh, our code should function exactly the same, which it does. So that is great. But now we can use this function right here and other places such as within this if statement right here. So as I mentioned, we want to predict whether or not our player is going to collide before it actually does. So let's start within W when we're going up. To predict this, we want to write an additional if statement with the circle collides with rectangle code. And then I'm going to add opening and closing curly brackets and we'll just throw this inside of there for now just to get the ball rolling. So if we look at this code, what is missing? Well, we have a circle, which is equal to our player. We're referencing boundary, but we don't actually have a place in which we can pull boundary from. Right here down below is where we're looping through and getting this boundary object. So whenever we're pressing up on W, we also want to loop through all of our boundaries to detect for collision. So in order to do this, we can go ahead and copy this line right here where we're looping through our boundaries. And then we can go ahead and wrap our if statement inside of it. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to add an ending curly bracket and an ending parentheses should look something like this. So right now this is saying if we're hitting up on the keyboard and we collide with any of these boundaries while we're going up, while we're going to set our player velocity on the Y axis equal to, should it be negative five, but rather zero because whenever we collide with something, well, it should be zero. But if we're not colliding with anything, we want to write an else statement. And this is where our player velocity is going to be equal to negative five. This is when we should actually be able to go up. So if I save and refresh this, I go down, I go to the right. Well, we still have the same issue. Why is that? Because we're not actually predicting the next move. We're still using the very same move we're on, getting the same velocity from our player that we're getting down here where we're actually setting everything to zero. 
So how do we predict the next move? Here's how we're going to do it. We need to edit this player that we're passing through into our function. And we just need to edit the velocity property, just that. So how do we pass player through right here while only editing its velocity property? Well, we can use some really cool JavaScript syntax. If I go ahead and wrap player in an object like so, well, now we're just creating an object with a property called player assigned to player. That's not what we want. We want to go ahead and use the spread operator, which is just dot, dot, dot. So all the properties and methods right here within player are going to be put directly within this object. We're basically just duplicating our player object, but by doing so, it's going to allow us to edit one of the properties. How do we edit just one of the properties with the syntax? Well, we can add a comma to the end of dot, dot, dot player, and now we can go ahead and reference a velocity property, which we know is on player. So right now we're only changing a property for velocity. All the other properties associated with player, such as position, those are going to remain intact. But if we want to change just our velocity, we could say we know our velocity X is going to be equal to zero because we don't want to test in that direction when we're pressing up on our keyboard. But for Y, we want to go ahead and edit our velocity to be negative five. Are we colliding with any rectangles in the next frame if our velocity is equal to negative five? And we know when we're down here and we hit up, we are definitely colliding with this rectangle. So this code should be activated and Y should be equal to zero, which means we're not going to stop. We're not colliding with this. We're going to keep moving to the side because remember, we only stop if this code down here is equal to true, but it's not going to be equal to true if player velocity on the Y axis is equal to zero. So we're going to keep moving, but only when it has this opening right here, when our player is not colliding with any boundaries is when we are going to set its velocity on the Y axis equal to negative five. So if I save this and try this out, refresh, go down, hit right and hit up. Well, we're still getting the same issue, even though if you think about it, this code should be working, right? Well, what is going on? Well, right now, when we're looping through all of our boundaries, we're literally looping through every single one of them. So even though we only want to test whether or not we're colliding with this boundary right here, we are testing for every single boundary that is within our actual game. And even though we might be testing true for this one, meaning we're setting Y velocity equal to zero, we are definitely not colliding with this one. We're not colliding with this one. So therefore we're still setting our velocity.y equal to negative five. So as soon as this triggers right here, as soon as we figure out that we are colliding with at least one boundary, we need to break out of this loop altogether because we do not want this to be set. So how do we break out of a for each loop once this is equal to true? Well, the typical way would be run through a for loop and call break like so. And this means we're not going to run through the rest of our loop. The thing is, if we're using for each syntax like we are right now, this break statement just doesn't work, unfortunately. So instead, what we want to do is we want to go ahead and refactor this for loop to be a traditional for loop where we can actually use break and get out of it altogether if we are indeed colliding with something. So instead of referencing boundaries dot for each, I'm going to delete this line right here. I'll also delete the ending of that for each loop. And now what I want to say in place of that at the top is for, I want to declare a let called i, this is going to be our iterator, set it equal to zero to start. And then I want to say if i is less than our boundaries dot length, then I want to go ahead and add one onto i until i is greater than this value right here, which means we are basically successfully looping through all of our boundaries. So I can create some opening and closing curly brackets and make sure at the end of this, you add the closing curly bracket right here. So all this code is ran inside of it. And now we just need to reference a boundary. So in order to reference a boundary with a traditional for loop like so, we can just go ahead and create a const called boundary. And now we can reference this from this, but we just need to set this right here equal to what? Well, our boundaries i, because we're grabbing our iterator, we know that whatever iteration of the loop we're on, we're going to grab it based on the iteration, set it in here and test whether or not this one boundary is being collided with our Pac-Man right here. We're going to do that for every single boundary using this new style of for loop. And if we do collide with one, we're going to call break. We're not going to call this code. We're just going to run on to the next code down here. So with that, we go down and then we want to check when we're going to the right, whether or not we are colliding with any of the rectangles, specifically this one. If we are, our velocity on the Y axis is not going to change. We're going to set it equal to zero, which means we keep going to the right because this isn't going to fire. But as soon as we are no longer colliding, we're setting our Y velocity to negative five. We're going to go up. This is going to fire down here, setting our X velocity to zero, but we're still going to be going up because we're pressing up on W and we're setting our Y velocity equal to negative five. So let's test it out. We go to the right and we hit up and we go directly up. Let's try it again. Hit right. And this works just perfectly. We're no longer stopping when I hit up. 
on the bottom side down here. And if I go to the left and hit up, well, now we have that perfect motion we're looking for. But right now we only implemented this for when we are hitting up. So when we are going from the bottom upwards, if I try this from the top and I try going down, well, we still have the issue where we stop along the way when I hit S on the keyboard. That is our down button. So we want to make sure that we do the exact same thing for S right here. And in order to do the exact same thing, we can simply grab this for loop and then delete this line of code within S, paste in this new for loop. And we want to monitor whether or not the bottom of our player is about to collide with a boundary beneath it. So if we want to go ahead and test that out, we'll change our velocity right here equal to 5. So now we know if we are about to collide with a boundary below, well our velocity on the y-axis should be equal to 0, meaning we're not actually going to stop our player at all, and then we break out of it. But if we're not colliding with anything, player velocity.y shouldn't be equal to negative 5, because remember, that's going to push us up. We want to go down, so our player velocity.y should be 5 instead of negative 5. So let's save and refresh. We go to the right, we hold down, and we make it through the gap. Let's try it again. Go down. Try from the left, go down. We are no longer stopping, we're going directly through the gap. We have the exact movement we want with this collision detection in place. So the next thing we need to test for is going through a gap, but from the left and to the right. So we need to go ahead and create a gap somewhere. In order to do this, we're going to create two more rows and we're going to create a gap right through the middle here, in which we can test out our collision detection. So to create this gap, this is pretty easy. It's a lot easier than creating columns. We're just going to go ahead and copy one of these rows. So I'll copy that. And then we're going to paste in two new rows. So now right here, we can determine where do we want extra boundaries placed. Well, I know I want one space beneath this one, so we're going to keep this space here, but right beneath that space, I want an additional boundary. I save and refresh that. We have exactly that. Let's go ahead and add a square over here. We're going to go two to the right of the boundary we just added, and then add in that additional boundary, save and refresh, and now that is generated. So now if I try going down, well, we have the exact same issue we had before. We are not predicting whether or not our player is colliding with boundaries on the side. So therefore, we just stop the x velocity altogether. It stops our player from moving. So all the code we wrote right here, we just want to go ahead and copy the for loop and then make sure we insert it for when we're going to the left and when we're going to the right. We'll go ahead and take care of our A key first. So we'll get rid of this line right here, paste in that for loop. And now we know we're looping through all of our boundaries, detecting whether or not they are colliding with our player, but we don't want to predict whether or not they're colliding when we're going up on the y-axis. We don't even want to deal with the y-axis, so we'll set y equal to zero, but we do want to detect whether or not we're colliding on the x-axis, so going to the left. So in order to do that, we're going to change our velocity to negative five, and then we want to go ahead and set our player velocity on the x-axis equal to zero if there is a collision, and then we want to break out of this. But if there is no collision, we want to allow our player to go through the gap. So nothing is colliding right here. We're going to set our player velocity dot x equal to negative five. That means we're going to the left when we press the A key. So we'll go ahead and test out the A key. I refresh, go to the right, go down and hold down A, and this works quite perfectly. We're not stopping anymore when we go to the left. Last thing we have to do is make sure we're not stopping when we go to the right. So we'll just copy this for loop, simple enough. And then down below within this else if, for our last key of D, we can paste that in. And then we just need to change our velocities on the x-axis from negative 5 to 5 like so. And this should work exactly as expected. So I refresh, I go down, and we're no longer stopping in any directions. And we have perfect movement through all these paths we just created. So really cool stuff here with pathing and collision detection for our Pac-Man game. So if I head on over to Todo, we can go ahead and check off adding collision detection. One of the hardest parts, I hope you guys were able to make it through that with the best of my explanations, but it's going to get a lot easier at least until we get to creating ghosts. So next up, we're going to go ahead and swap our boundaries out with images. We're going to make sure that these squares right here look like actual pipes that we see in some of the traditional games. So to swap out boundaries with images, we're going to want to head on over to our boundary class. Let's go ahead and find that. Search for boundary and this is where it is. So if we want to swap this out with some sort of image, we're going to add in an image property and say this dot image is equal to an image we pass through our constructor. So I'm going to add an image as a property within our constructor function. And then within draw, we're going to want to comment out this rectangle code and we're going to want to use C dot draw image instead. What does this take? Well, it takes an image. So we're going to reference this dot image. What else does it take? Well, it's going to take an X and a Y. And this is basically the X and Y position in which we should actually render out the image. We have those. So we're going to reference this dot position dot X for the X coordinate. And then for Y, we can reference this dot position dot Y. 
This is really all we need to get started with drawing images. So now if I save and refresh, we're just going to error out because we're trying to draw an image, but this dot image is never actually set because when we are creating boundaries, we're never passing through this image property. So where are we creating boundaries? Well, we can find this by searching for new boundary. This is the only place we're creating one. We're only creating these little dash boundaries right here. So we want to make sure that we're passing through not just a position, but also an image object. And this is going to be set equal to obviously some sort of image, but where the image comes from, well, we need to actually produce it in the first place. So for this tutorial, I went ahead and I created a bunch of different images that we can use for pipe layout. And this is what they look like. And I exported each of them inside of a folder called Pac-Man Assets. This will be available within the description of the video within a Google Drive link, so you can feel free to download these and use however you wish. I created them, so license free, baby. Use them how you want to. But you can see in here, I just have all these different images that are representing pipes in which we can connect these and create the exact layout we want. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy all of these assets. I'm going to select the top one and then select the bottom one by holding shift and clicking. And then I'm going to hit command C go inside of our Pac-Man project. And now I don't really have a folder for images inside of here. So I'll right click, hit new folder, call this IMG. This is where our images are going to go. And I'm going to paste in all those images. So now I can begin using them within my Pac-Man project. So I can go ahead and minimize these finders right here, open up our project again, and open up Sublime Text. So now you'll see we have this image folder and we can begin using all these images. So right here, when we pass through an image into our boundary class, we need to make sure that this image is of an HTML object, essentially. So in order to get this in that format, we're going to create a const. And just to start, we're going to call this a const of image. This is going to be equal to a new image. This is a default JavaScript object in which we can create basically an HTML image element. So now that I have this const of image, I want to go ahead and set image.source, the source of the image equal to whatever file I want to pull in. So if I want some sort of horizontal pipe like we have right here, look at this, we have a pipe horizontal image. So image.source is going to be equal to a string that goes inside of our image folder. So I'm going to reference that with dot slash IMG. We're going from the current directory inside of the image folder, and then we're going to reference pipe horizontal horizontal. Make sure the casing here is correct and then add dot PNG. So once we set the source of this image, now we can actually use it as the image element within our boundary and draw image should technically work. So if I save and refresh, now we have all of our horizontal pipes drawn out on the screen. Obviously this looks quite terrible though. And we might want to use some of these other pipe elements we have to create something that actually looks cohesive. So what we can begin doing is adding in different symbols that represent different images of our piping. So right here, this little dash, it makes total sense for this dash image to be a pipe horizontal image. But if we want to go ahead and have a vertical pipe instead, it makes sense to have something like an actual pipe character instead of the dash placed there. So let's go ahead and replace these side dashes with vertical pipes. To do that, I know I want a vertical pipe right here. So I'm going to line that up with our map and I'm going to go ahead and insert the pipe character. So I'll delete that and then I'll hit that pipe character. This is what it looks like. And I want to make sure that I replace all the dashes on the left with this pipe. So I'll copy my pipe and then start replacing those dashes with the pipe and basically just creating a layout within this little array right here that represents exactly what I want over here. So I'll do the same thing with the right side, only on the inner pieces, replace the dashes with pipes. We save and refresh, and now we lose the pipes on the left and right hand side because we're only checking for dashes right here. So this is where the switch case comes in handy. We can go ahead and create a new case by copying the current one, pasting it in, and then say we want to look for pipes instead. And when we're looking for pipes, we can go ahead and use a different image, but our boundaries are still going to function exactly the same. Really cool stuff. But the thing is, if I want to go ahead and import a new image, well, I need to go through this whole process all over again where I create a new image, assign it a source, really tedious. And like I showed you in the beginning for creating boundaries, really going to muddy up our code. So what we want to do is create a function instead. I'm going to create a function called create image. And this is going to take a source as an argument. So what I can do is I can go ahead and cut this code right here, paste it into create image. So every time we call create image, we have a scoped constant, in which we're going to set the source not equal to this right here, but rather the source we're passing through as an argument. So we'll add source right here instead. And then we just want to return the image being processed in here. 
So in order to get this to work with a horizontal pipe like we just had, now all we have to do is instead of reference image right here, we can call create image because we know that returns an image. And now we can just pass in that pipe horizontal source, save and refresh. And things are going to bug out simply because we don't have an image constant anymore down here. We can go ahead and add in a pipe vertical instead of image by pasting in the create image function. And we're no longer going to reference pipe horizontal. We should have a pipe vertical here. I think I forgot to export it. Just give me a second. So I just added that in to our folder of Pac-Man assets. I'm going to drag that in to our Pac-Man folder, specifically within IMG. I'll paste that in. So now it's there, great. Now that it's available, you'll see it is in our project now. So now we can actually reference pipe vertical like so. And we're creating a new image element that's being passed through right here. So now let's save and refresh. Now we have vertical pipes and we have horizontal pipes. We're starting to look better, but we're not there just yet. One of the main things making this look so off is we don't have any corner pipes in place. So you'll see right here, I have a pipe corner one, top left, pipe corner two, top right, pipe corner three, bottom right, and then pipe corner four, bottom left. We're basically going in a clockwise direction in regards to these corners and the numbers associated with them. So since we have these corners, we can go ahead and insert them just in these locations. So where are these locations? Well, the very first one is going to be this first dash. And if I want to go ahead and use some sort of symbol to represent pipe corner one, I guess we could go ahead and just use a number one. If you know a better symbol that's just one character, be my guest and change it with whatever you would like. It's totally arbitrary, but I think one makes sense, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and put it there. And now I know over here, I want the second pipe corner. So our very last corner element, I'll replace that with two. Down here should be three. So I'll go ahead and replace that with three. And then over here is going to be our pipe corner four. So I'll put four there as well. Save and refresh, they're no longer there because we need to add them into our switch case to say we want these specific images whenever we have a case of one, two, three, or four. So I'll go ahead and add in four more cases. I'm going to copy this one right here and paste it in four times. One, two, three, four. This makes my life a little quicker. And now I can replace this first pipe with one the second pipe with two, third pipe with three, and the fourth pipe with four. But we don't want to use pipe vertical. We want to use for pipe number one, we're going to use pipe corner one. And a quick way to do this is I can just go ahead and copy this string, replace all three pipe verticals right here with that string. And then I can just replace pipe corner one with pipe corner two, this one with pipe corner three, and this one with pipe corner four. So just by doing that, if I save and refresh, now we have perfect pipe corners in place. It's starting to look a lot, lot better. We have another issue is we should have blocks right here, not horizontal pipes. So where we have those horizontal pipes within our map right here, I'm actually going to go ahead and replace these with B. I think that makes sense for standing for block, just a block element that has all four sides on there. So I'm going to go ahead and put that there and you'll see we do indeed have a block image. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new case. I'll go ahead and paste that on in, replace four with B. And now I can go ahead and replace pipe corner four with block.png, save and refresh. And now we have a very good looking map compared to what we had before. So I think you kind of get the gist in regards to how to create your own game map and then switch out different images based on the case symbols that they have. So I don't waste your time too much. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create the rest of the cases for all these images behind the scenes. I'm going to create a game map behind the scenes as well with all those different images integrated. And I'm going to include them within a GitHub gist, which you can just go ahead and copy and paste both the map and the switch case statements. So you can use these within your game without having to type out all this work yourself. Okay, so it took me a little bit of time, but I did exactly that. And to recap exactly what I did, all I did was I created a lot larger of a map and I added a bunch of different symbols in here as well. Basically, I replaced all the spaces with these little dots, which are going to represent pellets later on. I added these little brackets right here, which are going to act as caps. So this bracket right here represents this bracket on the left side. This bracket on the right represents the right bracket. The seven in the middle represents a three-way connector with the down part open. And this little underscore right here represents a bottom side cap. This little guy right here, the top carrot, a top side cap. The plus sign, a four-way connector. You kind of get the idea with everything that's in here. All these additional characters that I added within our map, you can see they're added into our switch case down below. We have the brackets, which are cap left and bracket right, underscore, cap bottom, little carrot thingy, cap top. Plus sign, pipe cross, five is going to be a pipe connector top, that's the three-way one. Six is going to be pipe connector right, three-way. 
and then all these other ones are three-way as well. So just using all these images over here with a switch case, as long as you know what these cases actually produce image-wise, you can create really, really cool maps. And since we laid out our collision detection code the way we did, we were smart about it. We always take into account when we are colliding with some sort of boundary, everything is still going to work with this new map we generated. So if I go ahead and start moving throughout this, perfect collision detection and movement throughout the whole thing, no issues whatsoever. So really, really cool stuff here with generating a new map and creating a whole new landscape for our character to go around in. So if you wanna get up to speed with me, make sure you add those additional cases and make sure you add in that new map code available within the description on the GitHub gist, completely free. So let's go on over to to do. And now we're going to check off swapping our boundaries with images. We've definitely achieved that. So next up, we wanna go ahead and generate pellets. And then we want to go ahead and remove these pellets whenever we collide with them. So these are basically the collectibles for Pac-Man to go around the game and eat so we can increase our score. So how do we actually generate pellets? Well, we're going to want to start with a pellet class. And what is similar to a pellet? Well, simply our player. Our player is circular. Our pellets should also be circular as well. So in order to save us some time, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate our player class. Paste it down below. And this is not going to be player but rather pellet instead. So should a pellet ever move? Have you ever seen moving pellets in a Pac-Man game? I personally haven't, so we're going to go ahead and get rid of velocity. We don't need that. We do need a radius associated with these pellets, and they shouldn't be the same size as Pac-Man. They should be a lot smaller. So we'll say our radius is going to be three, and we should be good to go with that. Let's go ahead and go down to draw. What should the fill style of these pellets be? I believe within the Pac-Man games, they are yellow. So we should be able to leave this as is, but if we want to go ahead and just make sure they're a little differentiated from our player, we can go ahead and call them white. There's no big deal with that. So let's go ahead and change yellow to white. And do these pellets have an update function? Are they going to move? No, they're not. We can just go ahead and get rid of update. And now we have pretty much everything we need to create a full pellet. Pretty awesome stuff. So in order to render out our pellets, we're going to need some sort of array to hold them all. So right above boundaries, I'm going to create a const called pellets, set it equal to an empty array. Now we have that empty array in which we can store all these new pellets in. But when do we actually want to generate pellets? Well, we could do it the hard way, go ahead and create pellets within this pellets array using the pellet class, but that is way too time consuming. We're actually going to go ahead and use the switch case that we're using for our map because you'll see I replaced each of the spaces with dots. These dots are now going to represent pellets. But if we look within our switch case, I never actually added in a case for if we hit a dot meaning a pellet. So we're going to go ahead and do that ourselves at the very bottom of the switch case. I can go ahead and copy one of the cases and then paste it in and say when our case is dot, a period, meaning our case should be a pellet. Well, we don't want to push in a new boundary. We want to actually select our pellets array and push in a new pellet instead. And we know our pellet doesn't take an image. It just takes a position. So let's go ahead and call this and see what it looks like. Refresh, nothing showing because remember, whenever we create a new array like this, we need to make sure we're rendering out all the objects inside of it. So we're going to go ahead and select our pellets array, head on over to animate. And now right beneath our key functionality where we're rendering everything out, it's going to be right here above our boundaries for each. I want to go ahead and call pellets dot for each and say for each pellet within the pellets array, I'm going to select it within an arrow function and say, I want to call pellet dot draw. So I save and refresh. Now we have pellets on our game. Really cool stuff. Almost that easy. You'll see they're not in the correct position though. So we want to go back up to our switch case where we just added these in. It's going to be right here. And you'll see these pellets are almost spawning in the correct position. How do we get them in the center of where they should be spawned? Well, remember, how do we get our player in the center of this location? We went ahead and onto our boundary width, we also added the boundary width divided by two. Because if we want this pellet right here to be in the middle, well, we're going to get the width of one boundary. So here to here divided by two, that's going to place it in the middle. We're going to also add on boundary dot height divided by two. And just with that, all of our pellets are perfectly placed. Really, really cool stuff. So that's really all we need for generating our pellets. And if we look at to do, we just went ahead and generated pellets. So now number seven, we're going to remove these pellets whenever our player collides with them. So in order to do this, we're going to have some circle to circle collision detection code. So what we're going to do is go to where we are looping through all of our pellets because we want to monitor for each pellet, whether or not they are touching our player. 
So that's going to be right here within pellets.foreach and right beneath draw, we can begin our collision detection code. So how do we do circle to circle collision detection? Well, we're going to write an if statement that says if math dot hypot, that stands for hypotenuse. So what is the hypotenuse? Well, it's simply the longest side of a right triangle. And here it's basically going to be the distance between the center of one of our pellets and the center of our player. If you'd like to learn more about hypotenuses, be sure to check out that circular motion video I got. It goes over all of this in depth. But to keep this as quick as possible, basically what we need to put inside of mat hypot is going to be the difference between two x coordinates and the difference between two y coordinates, specifically the difference between our player and the pellets coordinates. So here within math.hypot, hypotenuse, we want to go ahead and get the difference between our pellet location and the player location. So to get our pellet location, we'll get pellet.position.x and then subtract player.position.x. And there's going to be a second argument here as well. So we want to do the same thing for the y-axis. What is the distance between the pellet on the y-axis here and our player up here? Well, we're going to get that with pellet.position.y minus player.position.y. That is going to give us the distance between our pellets and our player no matter where they are on the screen. But we don't want the distance between the center of each of our circles. We want the distance between the radii. So we want to say if this distance is less than our pellet radius plus our player dot radius, then we know they are indeed touching. So we can say right here, if this is true, we can console log out touching. If I save, open up our console and refresh that, we are indeed touching something. And if I keep going, you'll see that this is just going to be logged out forever because if I move, well, we're always touching some sort of pellet. We want to go ahead and start removing these pellets instead of just always touching them. So what I can do is say, if we're touching a pellet, we're going to select our pellets array, and then we're going to splice out the pellet that we're currently touching. So to get the pellet we're currently touching, we need to get the pellet index. And to get the pellet index, we can go ahead and select our for each loop. The second argument right here is going to be the index of the pellet we're looping over. So I'm going to say that is going to be equal to i. I want to splice out at i one item from that distance. So if I go ahead and save and refresh that and refresh, we're only touching once because we removed that one pellet we were touching last time. If I begin moving throughout this, well, I begin moving pellets all over and you'll see this is only called each time we actually touch a pellet. So this indeed will work for every pellet that we have within our screen. But something weird you might notice is when I move to the side, if you look really closely, well, these are actually flashing and it just makes our game look a little unprofessional. So if we're splicing out pellets from the beginning of an array and we try to render out one that might have been shifted because of this splice, well, it's going to give us this little annoying flash right here. So we could fix this by setting this in a set timeout function that's set to fire after basically one frame. Or what we could do is we could run through this loop backwards. And I honestly think it's probably cleaner for us to run through this loop backwards. So we're going to go ahead and do that instead. So how would I run through this loop backwards? Well, here what I would do is I would go ahead and create a standard for loop. So I'm going to go ahead and reference for, and when I go ahead and declare my iterator, I'm going to start it off at the length of the amount of pellets within our pellet array. So I'm going to say for let i, by default, it should be equal to pellets dot length minus one. Because remember, when we're selecting pellets within some sort of array, we start off at zero. That's why we're subtracting negative one here. So we're able to access that zero element. And then we want to say, we want to run this as long as zero is less than i. So this is going to be something like 30, I would guess. And we're going to keep running this as long as i is greater than zero. And for each iteration of this loop, we're simply subtracting one from i. So we're basically going from 30 down to zero. And that gives us one iteration of the for loop. When we go through our animation loop again, we're going to call this again and test for our collision all over again. So basically what we see right here with pellet for each, we want to get rid of this. We're going to add opening and closing curly brackets right here for our for loop. And then we need to select the pellet that we actually want to draw and test for a collision. So we can create a const called pellet, set it equal to pellets, and then use i so that we're iterating backwards from all the pellets within our pellets array. Because remember, this is going to be something like 30. So if we select the 30th element within our pellets array, it's probably going to be the very last one. But as we're going in reverse from the very end of our array, if we go ahead and splice the current one out, well, the position of everything before the one we splice out is not going to change. Only the stuff after it, which we've already looped through, which we've already drawn. 
So the thing is, when we do it this way, when we're looping from the back, well, we're not causing any weird rendering issues due to the change of position with elements later on within our array. So all we need to do now is make sure we delete the end of our previous for each down there. And then I'm going to go ahead and copy all this code that was within our for each loop and paste it within our standard for loop. So now if I save and refresh, you're going to see everything still functions as it did before, but we're no longer getting any weird flickering because we are looping and removing from the back. So very, very cool stuff. So now if I go to to do, we can go ahead and check off number seven, removing pellets on collision. So next up, we're going to go to number eight. We're going to start adding a score so that whenever we collect these pellets, we add onto our score by something like 10. So to add some sort of score, I don't really like doing it within Canvas. I just find the text, it's really hard to read. And a lot of times it's just way easier to do it within your HTML file. And I pretty much always recommend doing it that way. So here's the way we're going to do it. We're going to go within index.html. And what I'm going to do within here is create a paragraph tag above our canvas tag. And inside of this, I'm going to create one span with score inside of it, add a colon and a space. And then right next to this, I'm going to create another span. And this is going to be equal to zero to start. So if I save that and refresh, well, now we have our score text up here, but you'll definitely see that it's going to be black instead of white. So we can't see it, it just blends in. So for a paragraph tag, what I can do is I can add a style tag on top of this. And then I can just say, I want the color of this paragraph tag to be white. Save and refresh like that. Now we can definitely indeed see that, but this definitely looks a little old timey. If we want this to look a little more new age and actually match our Pac-Man game, we want to get rid of these little tails on each of our words. So we can go ahead and add another style called font family and set font family equal to sans serif. That's going to basically mean without the lines. So if I save that and refresh, no more lines, but it does look a little goofy with our score that big. I always find that a score with a text size of 14 pixels looks pretty good for my game. So I'm going to go ahead and say, I want one more property in here. Make sure you're separating these with semicolons like so. This property is going to be font dash size. Set it equal to 14 pixels. Save and refresh, definitely smaller. Looks quite good to me, but I wanna style this a little more to get it as perfect as possible. So if I go ahead and inspect this element by right clicking on it, hitting inspect, and then I hover over it within our console, it's going to be our paragraph tag. You're going to see the orange right there means we have margin on the bottom. That's just too much margin for me. I want it to be a little tighter. So I'm going to go ahead and say, I want the margin for our paragraph tag to be something like, let's just say six pixels, save and refresh. And that is looking a lot better to me. But if we just go ahead and set margin like we are right now, this is going to add margin on all four sides of our paragraph tag. So instead, I just want to go ahead and affect not margin, but margin bottom, save and refresh, gets rid of the margin on the left. And it definitely brings our game a bit closer to our score right here. And the margin that was coming from our paragraph tag by default is applied from the browser. So I just didn't want that much margin from the browser. So I overwrote it with margin bottom six pixels. Now this text and our game are a little close to the side and you might be thinking, well, we got rid of that space on the side with margin zero, but if I want padding on the inside of an element, it's better to use padding instead. So let's say I want 10 pixels of space from the top of our score element right here from our body. I can go ahead and say our padding is equal to 10 pixels. And if I want even more padding added to the left and right hand sides of our canvas, what I can go ahead and do is add a second value right here and say, I want it equal to 20 pixels. So this first value is going to give us spacing on the top and bottom of an element. And the second value is going to give us spacing on the left and right hand sides. So watch what happens if I save that. Nothing just yet, but that is just because it shifted us to a different position. If I go ahead and scroll to the left, you'll see that we are indeed in the correct spot. We have some padding on the left. We have an adequate amount of spacing on the top. And if I exit out of the console and your game looks like this, it's just because we just resized our screen. But remember within index.js, we are setting the size of our canvas to be the initial inner width and height. All you have to do is refresh. You'll see that padding is in place because we scrolled to the left and the top. And this is looking really good for a score label within our game. We don't really have to do much more styling within CSS. But what we do want to do is every time we collect a pellet is change this right here, the span of zero. So if we want to go ahead and select the span within JavaScript. We're going to give it an ID and say this is equal to our score L stands for score element. So I'm going to save that. And now I know I want to pull this within index.js. We're going to pull this the exact same way we did with our canvas. I'm going to go ahead and select this line right here. And beneath our C, I'm going to go ahead and say, I want a const of score L. 
And to get this, I don't want to select our canvas element, I want to select our element with an ID of score L. So to select an ID, I can add a pound sign, and then I just need to specify what is that ID. It's going to be this right here, score L. Make sure you have index.html and also index.js saved. And to test that you have this, you can console log out, score L, save and refresh, check your console, and there it is, we are good to go. So now we can begin changing this within our game. So that is going to represent our view element, but we also want some sort of variable within our code that actually tracks the numbers being added onto our score. So right beneath the last key, I'm going to add in a let called score, and this is a let because I know I want this to change. We're going to start off at zero, but over time, as we begin collecting pellets, this is going to increase. So where are we collecting pellets? If we scroll down to animate, it's going to be at the very bottom, about right here. This is when we're touching a pellet and then splicing them out. We can even add a comment above our for loop that says, touch pellets here to help us understand this code better. So now within pellet splice, we know this is where they're being removed. We can go ahead and say our score should have the value of 10 added onto it. So if I save and refresh, well, score isn't changing up here because although our score let might be changing in the background programmatically, we need to go ahead and change our view element that we pulled in to our file. So we're going to go ahead and get that with score L, grab its inner HTML. Inner HTML is just going to be everything inside of this element. So just the zero, and we want to set it equal to the score in which we're actually altering. So that is the programmatic score that we're adding 10 onto. So if I save and refresh and I start going, you're going to see for each pellet I get, our score increases by 10 and we update it on our front end because we're calling score l.innerhtml, setting it equal to the actual programmatic score. And this will just keep going until I collect all the pellets on the screen and basically there are no more, so we can't increase our score, right? So if we go on over to to-do, we can go ahead and check off. We added the score. Okay, so now we're going to create a ghost. We're going to create an enemy that moves by itself throughout our course, and then if we hit it, well, we lose the game. So how do we go ahead and create this ghost? Well, let's think. What does a ghost look like? I want to make it look like our player over here, just a different color. So it makes sense to find our player class within our code. And I'm just going to go ahead and simply copy and paste this below. And then I'm going to change this as needed. So really, what needs to be different from our player class to create a ghost? Well, of course, we should change the class name from player to ghost like so. And then I just want to say that the color of our ghost should be different, but I'm going to leave everything else the same for now at least. So in order to add some sort of dynamic color to our ghosts, we can add in a color property right here. Set it equal to some sort of default value in case we don't want to provide one. And I'm going to call this red. And then finally, we can assign a property of this dot color equal to the color we're passing through. And now we can utilize this within our other functions. So instead of referencing just yellow, I'm going to go ahead and reference this dot color. So great, we have our ghost class. Let's go ahead and create one now. I'm going to go down to our palettes and boundaries arrays. I'm going to create a new const, call this ghosts, and set this equal to a new array. So now I can begin populating this with a new ghost. So inside of this, I'll write new ghost. And this is going to take an array. And the first argument is going to be a position. So I'll go ahead and say for our position on the x-axis, I want this equal to zero to start. Same thing for y. That's going to spawn our ghost somewhere up here. For our velocity, this also takes an object with an x property, which I'm going to set to zero to start, meaning our ghost is not moving on the x-axis. And then y should also be zero, so our ghost isn't going to move at all to start. And then finally we have a color and we set that default value within our class equal to red. So we don't actually need to define that. But on save and refresh, we're not seeing anything because we need to call the update function within this ghost we just created. So we know this is within our ghost array. So we want to basically loop through this within our animation loop to get it rendered out on the screen. So I'm at the bottom of our animation loop right here. And right after player.update, I want to get rid of these two columns. They're kind of unnecessary right now. And I just want to go ahead and loop through that ghost array. So I'm going to select the ghost array. And then I'm going to call for each, like so. I want to say for each ghost within this array, call the following arrow function. And now that I have this one ghost object selected, I can call ghost.update, and we should see our ghost rendered out on the screen. So if I save and refresh, there's our ghost, but we want our ghost rendered right about here. So let's go back to where we created our ghost with new ghost. And we know that we want to basically change these two position properties of X and Y. Now our player is in a pretty good spot right here and we placed our player using our static property of boundary width, boundary height. I think it makes sense to copy this line right here, both of these lines actually, and then paste them in to our ghost position as well. So if we were to do that, 
Save and refresh. Now our ghost is where our player is placed, but we can go ahead and move our ghost over by one, two, three, four, five, and then actually six because we're adding on where we are right now by multiplying boundary width by six. So if I were to do that, and refresh, now we are placed perfectly in the spot we want to be. So now we can begin adding movement to our ghost so that it moves on its own and it begins choosing which path it wants to take completely randomly. It's going to create this really cool AI movement effect. So how do we actually do that? What's the algorithm associated with this? Well, we need to actually track our ghost collisions at any point in time. So if our ghosts were placed right here, what would the collisions be? Well, our collisions would be, we are colliding with the top if we were to move up, and we're colliding with the bottom if we were to move down. We're not colliding with the left, we're not colliding with the right, simply because we don't have some sort of boundary on the left and right of our ghost. But if we were to move our ghost over here, and let's do that with the code, change 6 to 7, if we were to move our ghost to this spot, what would the collisions be here? Well, we can move to the left, we can move to the right, we can now move down, but we still can't move to the top, so our only collision would be colliding with the top. So what was the difference with the collisions here compared to the collisions in the previous location? The only difference is we lost the down collision. So we want to go ahead and find the difference between the previous collision and what boundaries we are colliding with right now. And based on that difference, we're going to choose which direction we can take. So since down is missing, we know now we can go down and we can actually also go to the right, but we're going to add that in dynamically because it's going to be based on the movement of our ghost. It's going to make a lot more sense as we actually go through this. So let's go ahead and move our ghost back by changing seven to six. We're in a good spot, and now let's start detecting for collision. I'm going to go back to where we are looping through our ghosts at the end of our animation loop, so right here. And now, for each ghost that we have within our ghost array, I want to detect for collision for every single boundary within our course. So I'm also going to select our boundaries array within this for loop and say for each boundary, Within this array, I want to start detecting for a collision. So how do we detect for a collision as if we're predicting where we would collide if we were to move in a certain direction? Well, we know we did that with our player. We were predicting whether or not we're colliding upwards, whether or not we're colliding left, right, or bottom. So it kind of makes sense to find that code up above. You'll see right here within this else if statement, when we are pressing the D key, we are testing whether or not our player is colliding with the left side of a boundary. So what we can do is we can copy this if statement right here. I'm just going to grab the if portion, and then I'm going to paste it within our boundaries for each loop. So I want to go ahead and add some opening and closing curly brackets, and I'm not going to put anything inside of this just yet, but we want to test whether or not our ghost right here is colliding with any of our boundaries at any point in time. So instead of testing for our player, we're going to test for our ghost. And this is basically predicting the next frame in the future. Our velocity right here, if we set x equal to 5, we're predicting would we collide if we moved our ghost over by 5 pixels to the right? No, we wouldn't in this case, but we still want to test this. Everything else here is fine. What we want to say is if we are about to collide with something on the right side here, we want to select a collisions array and push into this a string of right. But we don't actually have a collisions array created just yet, and we know we want to detect collisions for every ghost we're looping over, so I'm going to create this collisions array right where we are looping over these ghosts. So I'll create a const called collisions, set the sequel to an empty array, and now we can begin pushing in the collisions based on where our ghost is and where we would be colliding if we were to move in a certain direction. So we just tested for collisions if we were to move to the right. Let's go ahead and test for collisions if we were to move to the left. All we have to do here is copy this if statement, paste it below, and then we know if we're moving to the left, x would be a negative value, so we'll set that equal to negative 5, and if we were to collide with a boundary on its right side, or ghost left side, then we would push in collision left. And now we want to do the exact same thing for top and down. So I'm going to go ahead and say if we are moving upwards on the y-axis, we shouldn't be moving on the x-axis, so I set that equal to zero. But if we're moving upwards, y will be equal to negative five. And then I know our collision is happening on the top, so I'm actually going to call this up instead of just top. And then I just want to detect if we're colliding with anything down. So I'll go ahead and copy and paste this one more time. Let's say if we're moving downwards, y will be equal to five instead of negative. And then we know we are colliding with something beneath our ghost, so perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and go outside of our for each loop for our boundaries, and then I'm going to console log out what, well, our collisions. What are we colliding with at this current point in time? So if I do that, save and refresh, and then open up our console, you'll see our collision detection code for our ghost is indeed working. We are colliding with a boundary on the top of our ghost and the bottom of our ghost, so perfect. But let's go ahead and start adding some velocity on our ghost right here to see what happens over time. 
So to add some velocity, I'll find where we're creating a new ghost. And we know if we want our ghost to move, we have to change our velocity to something greater than zero. So I'll change X to five, save and refresh. And our player goes off the screen, which is fine because we haven't told it how to react to these collisions. But you'll notice right here, we're pushing in multiple instances of the same direction into this array. It doesn't really make sense to have duplicates such as up in here twice. So we wanna make sure that we can only push one direction into this array at any point in time. So I'm gonna go back down to this collision detection code for our ghost that we just created. And I wanna say, well, yes, I wanna go ahead and push right into our collisions array if we're colliding with the right side of our ghost and the left side of a boundary. But I only wanna push this in if right does not exist within our collisions array in the first place. So within this if statement, I could say if collisions includes the string right and we are colliding with the left side of a boundary then i want to go ahead and push this in but this code wouldn't work because we want to actually say if collisions does not include right which means it's only going to be in there once then we want to push it in their array so what we want to do is copy this one line of code right here and add it into all of our other conditionals so i'll say if our collisions array does not include left because this is relating to our left right here and then if collisions array does not include up for up version of it and then finally, if collisions array does not include down for a down version, then we wanna be able to push it in. So with this quick check right here for each of our if statements, if we refresh, you'll see that we have a small issue here. It says collisions.include is not a function. This is just a small mistake on my part. This is actually includes, not include. So we'll go ahead and add an S to the end of each of our statements right here. No worries at all. So let's go ahead and add S to the end of each of these. And now if we save and refresh, now we don't have any duplicates within this array. The max we can have is either up, right, left, or down. No duplicates of up anywhere, so great. So now what we want to do is compare our previous collision with the current collision. We know when our ghost was placed right here, we had two collisions, top and bottom. When our ghost was right here, we had one collision, just the top. So what we can say with this algorithm is, if the amount of current collisions is less than the amount of previous collisions, well, we know something opened up, and that is indeed the case because we know the bottom opened up, we can now move downwards if we would like but we need a place to store the previous collisions. And I think the best place to store these is actually within each ghost instantiation itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up to our ghost class and I'm going to add an additional property in here called this dot prev collisions, just stands for previous collisions. And I'm going to set this equal to an empty array. And now that I have this empty array, I can begin storing our current collisions into it so we're going to go ahead, check where we are colliding with all of our boundaries, and then once we break out of this loop, we can go ahead and select our ghost dot previous collisions and set it equal to the current collisions that we just detected. And really, we do want to wrap this inside of an if statement that says if our collisions length is greater than our ghost dot previous collisions length, like so, then we want to run this code. Because remember, we might not be colliding with anything at all, such as if our ghost was here and we're detecting collision for this one boundary in the top left corner. We're not colliding there, so it doesn't really make sense to set an empty collisions array to ghost.previousCollisions. We only want to detect for collisions with the boundaries that we're actually colliding with, which are going to be these two right here. So we want to make sure that we're only setting this value if we're actually colliding with something. And we know we're colliding with something if collisions.length is greater than ghost.previousCollisions.length. So we're just simply going to add this conditional in here. So when we run through this the first time, Time. collisions is going to be equal to up and down based on where it goes to right here so therefore we're going to be setting ghost previous collisions equal to that but the next location which our ghost is is going to be right here collisions is going to be equal to just up so now we want to compare whether or not these two arrays are equal because although we're going to be colliding with top and bottom right here once we move over here we're only colliding with top something changed which means we can change the velocity of our actual ghost so we want to say if these two arrays are not equal to each other by saying if collisions is not equal to ghost dot previous collisions we can go ahead and begin affecting our ghost velocity but if we were to console log out some code right here just anything such as a string i'm going to comment this one out save and refresh and you're going to notice this just keeps console logging out over and over again by default since these are two separate arrays they are never going to be equal to each other we want to be testing that the array and everything inside of it are not equal to each other. So in order to do that, we can stringify this whole array. So to stringify this, I can call JSON, a native JavaScript API object. And then I want to call stringify. And this is just going to change our array into a string. It's going to be the perfect way to tell whether or not the array and its contents are actually equal to each other or not. So I want to do the same thing 
for our ghost previous collisions, so I'll call it JSON, stringify, make sure I'm wrapping previous collisions in that, save and refresh, and now you'll see that's really only called twice when we're actually within our map, and then of course it's called over and over again when we get over here, but previously it was just logging out go, no matter where we were in any point in time, but here you'll see once we hit here and here, we're going to log go twice, so watch very closely, I'm going to refresh, one, two. And then it just keeps going once we go outside the map. That is perfect. That is exactly what we want. We know right here and right here are where we can determine which direction our ghost is going to move. So we have our conditional written out correctly. Now we just need to write the code that actually changes our ghost velocity based on this condition. So when our ghost hits this right here, we know we have two pathways in which we can go to. We have down or to the right. So we want to go ahead and find those pathways within this if statement. So let's go ahead and just console log out our collisions within here first. And then I'm also going to console log out beneath it. Console log our ghost dot previous collisions, just so we can compare the two. And we're just going to focus on these very two first logs up here. So you'll see when we moved to this position right here, our collisions was equal to just up. We were only colliding with this up boundary right here. But previously, we know we were in this position. What were we colliding with? Well, no other than up and down. That makes total sense. So what is the difference between these two arrays right here? Well, the only difference is down does not exist within the first one. So down is going to be our potential pathway. We know we can go down. We can also go right. We're going to add that in, but this is the first step we need in order to create this functionality. So what is a smart way to get this down value right here? Well, in order to do this, we can go ahead and create a const called pathways. These are all of our potential pathways. We can select our ghost dot previous collisions and we want to filter out any collisions that don't exist within this first array so we're going to go ahead and loop through every collision within our previous collisions array and then we're going to go ahead and return a conditional that says whether or not this collision we're looping over exists within the first array so i'm going to go ahead and say if our original collisions array includes the collision we're currently looping over and I actually want this to be the inverse so I want to say if the original collisions array does not include the collision we're looping over that's going to give us this down value right here let's go ahead and console log this out if I console log our available pathways and I'm going to wrap this in an object like so just so I have a nice way to view what pathways actually is within our log if I save and refresh this you're going to see our pathways is equal to an array of one right here and I look inside of this and we only have that down property because we use this filter function to filter out the values that we never needed in the first place. So looking at this, yes, we can move down when we move right here, but we should also be able to move to the right. And we can't really detect that we were colliding with anything on the right previously because we're not going to detect that until we actually get to this point. So we want to go ahead and add into our previous collisions array before we call this filter function based on the velocity in which our ghost is actually moving. And by doing this, it's going to open up this other pathway over here and say, hey, our ghost can move to the right and it can move down. So in order to do this, I'm going to write an if statement right above our pathways code. And I'm going to say if our ghost dot velocity on the x-axis is greater than zero, meaning we are moving to the right. What do I want to do? Well, I want to select our ghost dot previous collisions and push into it that we could potentially collide with something on the right eventually, but we are just moving in the direction we can't. We need this to make sure we are filling up the pathways code correctly. So if I just go ahead and save that and then refresh, Let's scroll to the top so we can see this code up here. Now pathways is full of two items and I look at this and it's down and right. Simply because we added right to the second array right here, we're actually consoling this out before we do that. So if we were to go ahead and move this beneath our if statement, save and refresh, scroll to the top, you'll see within our previous collisions array, we now have the value of right, which is perfect. Now we have within pathways two potential pathways. We can go down to the right. And if we replicate this code for every direction we're moving in, well, it's going to make sure that we are creating that extra pathway in which we might be able to go. So we're giving our ghost a truly randomized effect into which pathway they actually choose. So what I can do is I can copy this if statement, paste it below, call it an else if, and say if we're moving to the left, if our ghost velocity, on the x-axis is less than zero, then we know we're moving to the left. There's a potential to collide on the left-hand side of our ghost. I'm going to copy this else if, paste it below. Say if our y is less than zero, our potential collision is up. And then finally, if y is greater than zero on this fourth else if, 
then we know our potential collision is going to be down. So that's not going to change much for our current functionality while we're moving to the right by default, but if we were to move to the left or somewhere else within our map, this would indeed take effect and put us in the right direction for filling up our pathways array with the correct directions. So now that we have this pathways array, we need to choose a random path from it. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and say const direction is equal to our pathways array and then I just want to go ahead and select a random direction so in order to do this I can call math dot random this will give us any value 0 to 1 and I can go ahead and multiply this by our pathways array length so since our pathways array length on this first value from here to here is going to be 2 we're getting any value 0 to 1 with this code but the thing is we can only select an object within our pathways array if we have an integer index so if we're trying to select it with something like 1.5 within this array it's just not going to work we need to make sure this value right here is an integer so in order to do that I'm going to call math.floor and wrap math.random and pathways.length inside of that. That just means if we get something like 0.5 for a random value, we're going to floor it. It means we're going to get zero for a result. But if we get 1.5, we're going to floor that. We're going to round down to one, and that's going to give us the perfect integer value we need to get some sort of direction. So now, if we console log out our direction, the random direction we want to go in, save and refresh, and I scroll to the top, you're going to see that initial direction we wanted to go in was to the right, but if I refresh, you should see that changes, that is down, and it's just completely random because we told it to do so. You see it just toggles between down and right. That is absolutely perfect. That is what we want. So based on this direction, we're going to change the actual velocity of our ghost. So what we can do is we can add a switch case that says we want to switch out the direction we just chose with what? Well, if our case is going to be something like down, what do we want to do? Well, we want to select our ghost velocity on the y-axis, and we want to set this equal to 5. That's going to start pushing us downwards. But we also want to make sure that we select our x-axis because we shouldn't be moving to the right anymore if this is our new direction. We should set this equal to 0 to make sure we stop completely and just move down between our boundaries right here. And then we want to add a break to make sure we break out of this case. And we want to do the same thing, not just for down, but also for if we get up as our case. We'll go ahead and change y to negative 5. We can leave x at 0. We want to do the same thing for if our case is going to the right, so y will be equal to zero. And we want to change our x to five, which just means we're moving to the right. And then finally, if our case for our direction is going to be left, our y should be zero and our x should be negative five. So this should move our ghost in a correct direction randomly, which is perfect. That is exactly what we want. But we want to make sure that after we call this code that actually changes our ghost's velocity, that we reset our ghost collisions because remember, we're going to have some sort of new collision once we actually start heading in that direction. We want to go ahead and set our ghost.previousCollisions equal to an empty array. And that's just going to go ahead and reset the whole process, restart the algorithm, so things should work as we continue to go through all these different corridors. So if I go ahead and save and refresh, just like that, we have pretty much perfect movement for our ghost throughout this whole maze-like thing, and it's completely random. You'll see each time I refresh, our ghost tends to go in a different direction. This is exactly what we want for some sort of basic AI in the game. So I hope that wasn't too confusing. That is definitely going to be the hardest part within this tutorial. So I really think it's going to be a lot easier from here. So I think we want to do two things here. One, we want to make sure that our ghost is going a bit slower because this might be way too hard for someone just starting out in the game. We want to go ahead and change our ghost velocity not to five, but let's just go ahead and say two. Now it's kind of annoying to have to change this in all four spots here and wherever else we are using five for our ghost's velocity. So instead of using 5 here, I'm just going to go ahead and say our ghost velocity should be equal to ghost.speed instead. And that's basically going to serve as our base velocity for x and y. So each place that I have 5 within the switch case, I'm going to replace it with ghost speed. And then I just want to go ahead and scroll up in our code here and see if we're setting our ghost velocity to 5 anywhere. And it looks like we are testing for our collisions using this 5 velocity right here. So I'm going to replace 5 with ghost speed in all these different locations where we are testing whether or not we are about to collide with something. And that seems to be the only place where we declared that within our collision detection code. 
So I know we also created a new ghost up here, we set its initial velocity equal to 5, but if we want to go ahead and set our velocity equal to ghost speed right here, we don't have a ghost in which we can actually reference an individual speed property. Here we would actually need some sort of static property that we can reference directly from our ghost class. So I'm going to change this lowercase g to uppercase g, just right here, we're going to create it in both locations, so we can leave everything else we just did the same. But let's go ahead and change that lowercase g to an uppercase g, and now we just want to find our ghost class. We're going to create two properties, a static one outside of the constructor called speed. By default, I'll set it equal to two to slow this guy down. And then I want to go ahead and create a property within our constructor since we use that within some of our other code. I'll call this dot speed equal to two as well. Now we only have to change it in two places compared to eight if we want to go ahead and affect our speed later on. So if I were to go ahead and save that, watch what happens. Refresh. And it looked good, but now our code is just thrown out of whack. Why is that? Well, when we decrease our velocity to two and we're detecting for collisions, such as if our ghost respond here, if we're detecting upwards and downwards, well, a velocity of two wouldn't be enough to actually push us into one of these boundaries. Therefore, our collision detection code is saying we're not actually colliding with these two boundaries right here when we are spawned here. So if we want to go ahead and decrease our velocity, we need to change our collision detection code to take into account padding above, below, to the left, or to the right of one of these boundaries. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down to circle, collides with rectangle, and inside of this, we're going to go ahead and create a const called padding. Now this is going to be equal to our boundary dot width divided by two. Because what we need to do here is we need to get the amount of spacing between our player or our ghost and our boundary. So this little gap right here of black space, this is what we want to go ahead and add into our collision detection code. So if we go ahead and get boundary width, we're going from here to about here. We want to go ahead and divide this by two. When we divide this by two, we get the distance from here to the middle of our player. But now we know we can get this small distance right here by subtracting our player or our ghost radius. That is going to give us a small amount of distance. So here I'll grab the circle that we're using within this function, specifically the circle's radius, and this should give us this little amount of space. But we do want to subtract at least one pixel because we don't want our player or our ghost to be colliding with the space by default. So we're going to go ahead and subtract one from this padding. And now we can begin using this constant within our return statement. So let's go ahead and look at this. Our circle position y minus circle radius, that's going to be the top of our player we want to say, if this is less than what? Well, our rectangle position plus our rectangle height, that gives us the bottom of the rectangle, plus our padding, that's going to add that small amount of padding right here, then we know we are colliding with this boundary. We want to do the same thing for all four directions. So the second condition right here is going to say, if our circle position x plus its radius, that's going to be the right side, is greater than or equal to rectangle position dot x minus our padding, that means our player or our ghost is colliding with the padding on the left side of one of these boundaries, then we know we are colliding. This condition right here is going to monitor the bottom of our player and also the top of one of our boundaries. We can say the top minus our padding, and then we can deduct if the left side of our player is less than the right side of our rectangle plus our padding, then we know we are colliding. So if we go ahead and affect our code like this to take that padding into account for our collision detection, save and refresh, well, now our ghost goes back to normal. We don't have that weird code in place. Everything functions exactly as expected, except we can use this new speed. You can also use the old speed. I already tested it, so perfect for increasing the difficulty of a level. But now we have something that's a lot more doable, at least in the beginning stages of the game, to make sure that we get all these pellets without our ghost just completely destroying us. So now that we have this movement in place, let's go ahead and make sure that whenever a ghost hits our player that we just end the game. To end the game, we're going to just console log out the text, you lose, and then we're going to go ahead and just pause our animation altogether, and that's all we're going to do for this. So in order to do this, what we want to do is create some sort of animation ID, and I'm going to make this a global variable. I'm just going to declare this right above our function of animate, so I'll call this let animation ID. You don't have to set it to anything to start, but within animate, Request animation frame is always going to return the ID of the frame we are currently on, and we need that in order to cancel or pause our game when we are ready to. So here, what I want to do is I want to store request animation frame, the ID that it returns inside of our animation ID let. This is all I'm going to do, and I'll save and refresh. This is going to function exactly the same, but if I were to console log out animation ID like so, you're going to see the animation ID is in place. This just stands for whichever frame we are currently on. 
So now that we have this animation ID, we can begin detecting for a collision between our ghosts and our player. So here I'm going to go down to where we are looping through all of our ghosts one more time. And this is going to be right here. And before we even go to the boundaries, we can go ahead and say we want to test for a collision between the current ghost and where our player is at any point in time. So where did we use circular collision detection before? Well, we know whenever we run over one of these pellets, we are removing it from our game. That is where we use circular collision detection. And that is going to be right here where we are touching the pellet. So what we can do is we can just grab this if statement right here and begin refactoring it for collision detection between our ghost and our player. So if I were to grab that, paste it beneath ghost.update, make sure I have opening and closing curly brackets, let's go ahead and look at this hypotenuse function. I want to say if the position between not our pellet position x, but our ghost position x, minus our player position x, and then our pellet position y, not pellet position y, but ghost position y minus player position y is less than our ghost radius plus our player radius, then we know the two are touching. But if we know these two are touching right here, what do we want to do? We want to go ahead and call the function cancel animation frame and this takes one function it's going to be a number the current frame we are currently looping over for animation frame where are we getting that no other than animation id so we have that in place let's also console log out you lose to really rub it in our face so if we save that and refresh when our ghost touches us we should get that text logged out and our game stops completely we're no longer logging anything and we get the dreaded text you lose. So now we know our score. We can restart the game by refreshing if we would like. But we have that functionality in place for collision detection between our ghost and our player to actually create some sort of formidable enemy. So the last thing I want to do in regards to ghost creation is just create a few more ghosts. And based on the way we set this up, this is going to be super, super simple. So where we created a new ghost originally, all I have to do now is just copy this new ghost, add a comma to the end of it, and paste in a new one. And here, I can either change the position and or the color. So I'm going to change the color for this one to pink. And I want this ghost to spawn somewhere down here. So I'm going to multiply its height by something like three. If I go ahead and save that with a new ghost in this ghost array, you're going to see now we have a pink ghost as well. It's already coming after me, pretty scary stuff. But if I go ahead and touch this pink ghost, our game ends just the same. So now we have an even harder level for us to play in. So I think that's pretty good. If we go over to to do, we just created a ghost. So now let's go ahead and create a power up so that when we retrieve it, we can go ahead and chase our ghosts and eventually that'll expire and they can come back at us. So in order to create a power up, I'm just going to go ahead and copy the closest thing to what a power up would be, which is actually going to be our pellet. I'm going to copy this class and paste it below. And I'm just going to call this power up so I don't get too confused with the abstraction of the pellet class. I always like making these little different just personal preference. So this power up is just going to be a simple circle but I'm going to make sure that it's a little bigger than a normal pellet. I'll say that its default radius is going to be equal to 10 and we can actually leave the fill style for this power up white. I think the radius will differentiate it enough and now we just need some sort of array to store these power ups. So I'll go ahead and create a new const called power ups set it equal to an empty array, but I'm not going to create a new power up directly within this array like we did for our ghosts. I'm actually going to go ahead and create this within our switch case statement using our map. So right down here within this giant map we pasted in, right here I have a key for P. This stands for power up. You might've noticed this is in here. It doesn't actually spawn anything in the bottom right, not a pellet or anything else. So what's supposed to go here is going to be the power up that we create. So we know if our case is P, we want to push in a new power up pellet within that one spot. So within our map for each code, where we are determining what goes where based on our map, we can go to the very bottom and then copy the very last case, paste a new one in and say, if our case is equal to P, we don't want a new pellet. We want to go ahead and reference our power up to array like so. And we want to create a new power up inside of it. And we can actually keep position exactly the same. This should put us in the exact correct spot for where this should be spawned. So if we were to just add this case of P in here and refresh, you're not going to see anything just yet because I guarantee you this power ups array is populated. We just need to make sure that we're rendering it out on the screen. So where we are rendering out our pellets, we can search for that by looking for pellets. We can also go ahead and loop through our power ups. So to loop through our power ups, I'm just going to go ahead and copy this for loop right here paste it above and create an ending curly bracket. And here I'll go ahead and say, this is where our power ups go. And now I know I should be equal to not pellets.length, but power ups.length. We're just looping through all the power ups within our power ups array. This is a good way to do it with this for loop. And now since we're looping through each power up, I can select the const 
of power up for the individual power up we're looping over currently. Select our power ups array and then get the index to get that one exact power up. So now that I have that one power up, I can call the draw method on top of it. I save and refresh and still not being drawn there, unfortunately. And that is because if I look at our for loop really closely, we just have to add one little thing in here, which I forgot. If we want to make sure we're looping through everything within our power ups array using this sort of for loop, we want to make sure that this should be less than or equal to I. And it should actually be the same for a pellets for loop right here. So we'll change that as well. And that's just going to make sure we loop through everything. If we just had zero as less than I, then we wouldn't actually be looping everything if we only have one item in there. So we just want to make sure that we change that. And now on save and refresh, there is our power up pellet. That might even be a little big for my liking. So where we declared its radius, power up right here. We'll go ahead and change this to eight instead of 10. And that definitely looks different enough from our pellets and different enough from our goes to tell well this might actually be some sort of power up so now we want to go ahead and detect for collision between our player and this new power up so we're actually going to jump right back down to our for loop that we just created and that's going to be right here where our power ups go and in order to detect for collision between two circles we know we can grab this if statement with math hypot and just paste it inside of our for loop right here. It's going to have an opening, closing curly bracket. We want to detect for a collision not between our pellet, but for our power up, the current one we're currently looping over. So I'll replace pellet in every location with power up. And now this will say if the two are colliding, our player and our power up, what do we want to do? Well, we want to go ahead and splice our power up out of the scene. And we can just use the same exact code that we have right here for our pellets. If I copy this line and then change pellets to power ups, we're going to splice it out. There's not going to be any flicker or anything like that because we're looping backwards using this for loop. Save and refresh, and I go for that power up down here, grab it. It's spliced out of the screen. There was no flash or anything like that. But now we should activate either a power up property on our player or some sort of disadvantage property on our ghost, such as a scared property. So I think I'm actually going to activate a scared property on our ghosts, and based off that, I can also change their color. So we know right here, this is where player collides with power up inside of this we can also make ghosts scared so how do we make our ghosts scared well we want to loop over every ghost so we'll grab our ghost array and then say for each ghost within this array we'll call some sort of callback function and now we can go ahead and set a ghost dot scared property equal to true and we know we don't want our ghosts to be scared forever so inside of this we can also add a set timeout and this is going to take an arrow function for the first argument that says, what should we do after some amount of time has passed? Well, we want to go ahead and select our ghost, set a scared property back equal to false. And this should happen about after three seconds. And we can console log this out to make sure that it's actually happening after those three seconds occur. I'm going to go ahead and console log out, go scared. For one, when we change this property in the first place, when we touch our power up, and then two, for when this power up expires. So if I were to go ahead and save that and refresh, and grab our power up down here. You're going to see we had true logged out right there and after three seconds, now we have false that power up has worn off. That's all we really need to do. So I can go ahead and get rid of these console logs now that I know that's working. And now I wanna go up to our ghost class. So we know we have a scared property associated with our ghost. We'll go ahead and add that in. Say this.scared by default is equal to false. And now we can use this property to affect our ghost's color. So a cool way to do this is with fill style right here, I can reference this.scared. And now if this is true, I'm going to add in this little question mark, which says, what do we want to assign to fill style if this.scared is equal to true? Well, if it's equal to true, I want to assign to fill.style a color of blue, just a simple string. But if it is false, I can declare the false statement by adding in a colon right here to say, well, if they're not scared, I want to assign it to the initial color of our ghost, which is either going to be red or pink or whatever we assigned to it. So this is all we have to do to change the color of our ghost using this cool little ternary operator. That's what it's called with question mark and the colon. So I save and refresh. I grab our little power up down here. They turn blue immediately because they are currently scared. And then after three seconds, they go back to normal. So great. Now when they're scared, we need to remove them from the game and make sure they don't hurt our player when the scared property wears out. So how do we do that? We're going to go back to our collision detection code where our player 
collides with our power up. We know all of this is happening down here, and I think that time limit of three seconds is a little short based on what I saw, so I'll change our three seconds to five instead, just so we can test this out really well. And then we want to go ahead and scroll down to where we are testing for a collision between our ghost and our player, and it's going to be within this ghost uh, for each loop right here. So I can say ghost touches player for this conditional we know we lose right here but we only want to lose if well this is true but also if our current ghost is not scared so we want to add an exclamation to this to say we're not scared or at least the ghost isn't scared and now if i save and refresh and grab that power up you're going to see when i touch a ghost there's no issue we don't lose the game but eventually when they come back to normal and we touch again well now we actually lost the game how sad so if we touch a ghost while they are scared, we want to remove them from our game. But if we're removing ghosts from our game, it pretty much makes sense to always loop backward with our ghost array so we don't get any weird flashes. Because if we were to go ahead and remove a ghost while we're within this for each loop, we're pretty much changing the structure of the ghost array. And it makes for some really weird stuff to happen in regards to flickering and other sorts of messes. So instead of doing this collision detection code right here within this ghost for each, I'm going to actually cut it out. And I'm going to go up to where we are looping through our pellets and our power-ups. And now I can create a for loop like this specifically for our ghosts. So here we'll say detect collision between ghosts and player. And now I just want to go ahead and duplicate one of these for loops. But first I'll go ahead and paste in that conditional that we just grabbed. And now I'm going to grab this for loop right here, paste it above, add an ending curly bracket, save so that's inside of it but now i know i'm not looping through our power-ups i want to loop through our ghost array this is just going to loop from the very end of our array and now i need to actually grab a ghost by declaring a const called a ghost set it equal to ghosts i that's going to give us the ghost we're currently looping over and now we're going to go ahead and call this code right here which determines whether or not we lose but we also want code within this that says whether or not we should remove a ghost in the first place so what i'm going to do is i'm going to get rid of this and statement that we just added and inside of this, I'm going to write an additional if. So I'm going to say if our ghost actually is scared, then we want to splice it from the screen. So I'll go ahead and say ghosts.splice. Where do we want to splice this from? While well, the current index we're looping over from the very end of our ghost array, which is I, as you can see right here, this is where we're looping through. That is the index. So I want to go ahead and splice one out from that specific position. So basically we're saying if we're touching a ghost that is scared, we go ahead and remove them from the game. Else, what do we want to do? we touch a ghost that is not scared we lose the game we cancel our animation frame we lose <laughs> end of story so if i go ahead and save and refresh now and i grab that power up they are scared they are blue if i touch one we just remove them from the screen altogether, and then eventually they go back to normal i touch it and we lose the game so if i go back to to do we just created a power up and we added all those cool effects with our ghost being scared removing from the game really cool stuff with that power up so pretty much all we need to do now is add a win condition and then add the Pac-Man Chomp animation. Kind of already did number 12, but let's go ahead and add a win condition. What we're going to say is if we go ahead and eat all these pellets, we're going to console log out, you win, and we're just going to pause the game as well. Really simple win condition for a basic version of the game so we don't go too over time here. All we need to do here is go to some sort of empty spot within our animation loop. I'm just going to do this right after this for loop we just wrote. And I'm going to say win condition goes here and in order to detect whether or not we are winning we just need to write an if statement that says if our pellets dot length is equal to zero meaning that we ate all the pellets we won the game it is that simple so i'm going to go ahead and write some opening and closing curly brackets create a console log that says you win and then we know if we win we also want to cancel our animation frame to stop all movement, because our ghost might still be moving around. And if I save and refresh that, and then finally catch all the pellets, let me do my best to do that without dying. You're going to see, once I get this very last pellet right here, we win the game, we stop it all together. We have our win condition in place. So now what we could do if we wanted to continue this within this if statement right here, we could proceed to a next level. We could affect the amount of ghosts within our ghost array, change their velocity to make our game harder, or generate a completely new map. We will be doing a little bit of that within the premium course, but this is definitely a good way to get going for showing you how to get that win condition in place. So if we look at to-dos, 
we're going to check off add win condition we already laid out a full level i believe we did that when we were swapping out boundaries with images so we'll check that off as well so now all that is left and i wanted to make sure that i include this in this game is the pac-man chomp animation because that is a classic can't really have a pac-man game without that so how do we make sure that our little circle right here is chomping like pac-man we're going to go over to our player class and this is actually going to be maybe a little easier than you think. We don't need a sprite or anything like that. All we need to do is edit our c.arc function over time. So the c.arc function right here is 0 and math pi times 2 determine the arc in which our circle is drawn. So if we were to increase this value here or decrease this value right here, we actually wouldn't have a full circle. Watch what I mean by this. If I go ahead and change 2 to something just like nothing, just math pi, you see now we just have half a circle. But if I were to go ahead and subtract 0.75 from 2, save and refresh, well now we have almost a full circle, it's just a little bit is cut off, and it's always going to be that way if we just use arc right here. So at the end of our arc, what I want to say is I want to add in c.line2 and draw a line from the end of our arc right here to the center of our player. So I want to go ahead and do that. I can just say our line2 should go to this dot position dot x because that is the center of our player and then this dot position dot y when we do that save and refresh now we have what's the beginning of an open mouth for our pac-man so we know subtracting 0.75 from this value right here opens up a little bit of our pi let's go ahead and add on 0.75 to 0 right here for our first ratings argument and if i do that now we have pretty much a fully open mouth for our pac-man so really what we want to do is we want to oscillate this value right here between 0 and 0 0.75 this one right here as well these are going to be a radians property so right beneath the radius i'm going to go ahead and say this dot radians is equal to 0.75 and now that i have this dot radians in place i can replace 0.75 in both of these locations with this dot radians and now i can begin changing this property over time to make sure it's oscillating between 0 and 0.75 so to do this i need some sort of open rate how fast should our pacman mouth be opening and closing I'm going to go ahead and say beneath this dot ratings, I also want an open rate. And I'll set this equal to 0.12, and you'll see how fast that is once we actually add it in. And within our update function, I can say if this dot ratings is less than zero, or this dot ratings is greater than 0.75. So these are basically our oscillation values. What do I want to do? If we go beneath zero or above 0.75, I want to go ahead and grab our open rate and set it equal to a reversed version of it. So we're basically going to be oscillating between these two values at all times. And now that I have open rate going back and forth, what I can say is I want to go ahead and add on to this dot radians, both this dot radians and also this dot open rate. And that's going to make sure that this radians right here is always pulsing between zero and 0.75. So if I save and refresh, now you see we pretty much have the perfect animation for a Pac-Man, no sprites or anything like that. Just the perfect opening and closing mouth. Still works whenever we move. But you'll notice one issue. If I start moving down, our Pac-Man doesn't rotate to go downwards in that direction to make it look like he's actually eating the pellets below. So we need to apply some sort of rotation effect based on which direction our Pac-Man is currently moving in. So it's been a few days since creating this tutorial, and I don't actually remember if we covered rotating or not, but let's go from the beginning. Rotating on canvas is a pain in the butt. They don't have any good function in which we can just turn our Pac-Man and have him move in the correct direction. So in order to rotate something on canvas, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to go inside of the draw function, in which we want to rotate the art of. And before we actually call any art or drawing functions, I'm going to call C dot save and at the very end of these i'm going to call c dot restore because basically what we're about to do is we're about to apply some sort of global canvas function to this code right here and if we weren't to use save and restore at the beginning and end of this well the global function would affect everything on our screen we only want it affecting this code right here which is why we're wrapping this in save and restore so now that we have that in place, we need to call a c.rotate function, which is a global canvas function. But by default, c.rotate rotates from wherever our canvas starts, which is going to be right here. So if we were to call this code, basically we'd be rotating our Pac-Man, but not from the center. We'd be rotating from this position. We want to make sure that we're rotating our Pac-Man from the very center of it. So what we can say is we can call c.translate, which is another global canvas function. And we want to translate our canvas to the center of our Pac-Man position. So we can translate on over to this.position 
dot x and then this dot position dot y for the y value that's going to put us directly within the center of pac-man now we can begin rotating it based on some value these are radians i'm just going to put zero in here for now but then once we rotate our pac-man we want to go ahead and move our canvas back to this position so the rest of the code fires correctly so to translate our pac-man back i'm going to go ahead and call c.translate again but we're going to go in the negative direction of this dot position x and this dot position y. So now if I wanted our Pac-Man to face the opposite direction, I would change this value here to math.pi. This is in radians. When you have radians of math.pi, that means you're going 180 degrees counterclockwise, I believe it's counterclockwise. It shouldn't matter anyways. But if we go ahead and put math.pi and c.rotate now with all that translate code in place, you'll see we're facing the opposite direction, but when I move, we're still not facing the correct direction. So what we want to do is add a property called this Dot rotation. We'll set it equal to zero by default, so we're facing the right. But now we can get rid of math.py and reference this dot rotation within C dot rotate, and we can begin changing this based on which direction we are currently going. So we could go ahead and change our rotation all the way in the bottom within our event listers right here, but I almost always find there to be some sort of issue when I try changing player properties within here. So instead, I'm just going to do this directly within our animation loop. This is the end of animate right here. So I know inside of this, I can reference which direction our player is currently going by asking if our player dot velocity dot X is greater than zero. I know I'm going to the right. So our player dot rotation should be equal to zero. And I can go ahead and say else if just by copying this and adding an else to the beginning of it. Else if our player velocity X is less than zero, our player rotation should be 180 degrees, which is math dot pi and radians. And then I'll copy and paste and say, if our y velocity is less than zero, then I want to go up. That is math.pi divided by two in radians. I'll copy the line again and then say, if we're going down, we should be facing downwards. And in order to get this, we can go ahead and multiply math.pi times 1.5. And that should set our player rotation in the correct direction with all of our draw code in place as well. So I go ahead and save and refresh. If I move down, well, it looks like I had that reversed, actually, if I go up. Okay, I definitely reversed those two lines of code. No problem. It looks like left and right work. So really, we just need to go ahead and say this right here, math.pi divided by 2 should be when y is greater than 0. And then when we multiply by 1.5, it should be when it is less than 0. So if I go ahead and save and refresh, I go down, we face the correct direction. I go up, we face the correct direction. And this works within any corridor we go in. So pretty cool stuff for creating our very first Pac-Man game. So that's going to be it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to check out ChrisCourses.com for any future updates. But really enjoying this game myself, and I hope you guys did too. I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Peace.